who is a Bob Diamond, who is a, a transportation guru in CB2 and had and had supported uh, uh, trolleys tremendously. He died in August. I also want to take a moment of silence for Apolline Mung Gulemi, Gulemi, who was a three month old, who was unfortunately and tragically killed on Gates and Vanderbilt by a driver going the wrong way, who had 160 traffic violations since 2017, including 91 uh, speed cameras in, a school, in school districts. And I think that that's a tragedy that we should recognize. And when we do new business, I think it's something we should bring up. And unfortunately on, on those two extremely sad notes, let me welcome everyone to the uh, 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 committee. Uh, we welcome the participation of the public at the appropriate time. When we go into questions, it will be committee members first, then non-committee board members, and finally the general public. Now the general public is, is limited to two minutes, but if there's more than one person from the same organization, I ask you to do it together and limit it to, to four minutes. This meeting is gonna be very long to begin with. And I ask you to assist us in letting us get everyone uh, to, uh, to speak so we can hear their opinion. And on that, welcome. I would like, uh, uh, John, can you do the roll call of the uh, uh, committee members? Sure, sir. I'm gonna answer for those who I know are here, and but I'm gonna leave us a pause for those who may be signing on now and I can't see it on the scroll. Chair Sid Meyer here, Secretary John Quint here, Ernest Augustus here, Sandy Balboza? Here. Here. Uh, Juliet Cullen Chung here. here, John Dew here, Doreen Gallo? Here. Uh, Cheryl Gelbs is excused, Brian Howell is here, Patrick Kalaki? Ciro Scala. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Thank you all. I know there's some non-committee uh, board members here as well, and, and we will be happy to uh, uh, hear from you as well later on. Uh, the uh, Department of Transportation has asked us to uh, uh, put the BQE Kent Labor project before the open restaurants. And I have no objection. And can I get a motion to approve the agenda as amended? So moved. So moved. Second, John Do. Hearing no objection, the, the agenda has been, been uh, approved as amended. So we will go right into the uh, BQE cantilever project. And who's presenting for DOT? Hello, um, this is Jimmy Kim at New York City DOT. And um, I'm joined by my um, colleagues um, who will be co-presenting um, Paul Schwartz, our acting deputy commissioner of Bridges is on the phone. Um, you all know Keith Bray, who um, he's not presenting, but he is um, available to take comments and questions. Um, we have Dan Schack, our consultant from Sam Schwartz Engineering. Um, and uh, we have a, a couple other folks. I, I'm just going to quickly um, apologize if I don't get everyone. But um, and thank you to our colleagues at City Planning for <laughs> letting, letting us jump in line. Um, and it's nice to see some familiar faces. Um, so let me, um, should I go ahead and share my screen? Would that be okay? Yes. Okay. They have to, they have to let you. Uh, I think, uh, let me see. Uh, here we go. I think I've got it. Is that working? No, not yet. Okay. I'm on this. Um, hmm. 
I'm on this double monitor situation, so sometimes it's hard for me to. Okay, here we go. Does that work? Yeah, it's coming now. There you go. Okay. Um, all right. So um, I was kind of scrolling through the attendees tonight, and um, I know we had a um, uh, a public meeting a couple weeks ago um, before the implementation of the two lane BQE. And I was going to ask for a show of hands um, about who um, participated in that, but I think this is such a large group. I, what I'm going to do is go through the full BQE strategy presentation. Um, I can go, um, I can certainly stop on slides and spend a little bit more time, but we have a lot of ground to cover. So um, there are certain pieces that I may go, you know, flip through a little quickly. Please interrupt me. Let me know if you have questions or want um, to spend a bit more time on a particular slide or topic. Um, so thank you again um, for hosting us tonight. Um, our agenda is as follows. We'll do a quick intro and then talk about um, the three-pronged um, approach to preserving, uh, maintaining the BQE. Um, we have a strategy that is all about safety, um, through the extension of, um, you know, preserving our the structural life um, of the of the cantilever, um, we have Paul Schwartz who's going to talk to you about the near term repairs that are already underway and and what uh, what more is to come. Mm -hmm. Um, we are also going to, um, you know, talk about the uh, long-term community visioning process that we will be launching this fall. Um, so that's, those are the various components. Um, I think all of you, um, I don't need to give too much um, background and detail on the BQE, um, its significance, the critical need, um, and and the urgency um, that um, this, you know, that this highway and the attention that this highway um, needs, um, and and really, you know, when when um, Commissioner Gutman and I started earlier this year, um, we were charged with developing a strategy for the BQE that focused on safety, but that also talked about. Um, you know, really accommodating a, a vision for the future. Um, one of the big issues, and I'm going to actually turn my uh, outlook off because it keeps popping. Um, one of the, the key issues that we observed, and I'm sure you all are um, keenly aware of, is the fact that the BQE carries thousands of trucks, meant, you know, a significant portion, which are overweight, we know that not only is this a nuisance um, to uh, you know the nearby communities, but it really does you know create um, wear and tear on the structure. So this is an absolutely important time to get um, the BQE right. Um, so what does that mean? What we want, what we seek to do, is to make sure that the structure is safe and that it stays safe for many, many years to come, um, that it's safe to drive on, that it's safe to support the, um, the, the neighborhoods above, that it's safe to support the promenade. Um, and then we also think it's important to begin to imagine a future for the highway, uh, a, a highway that is um, more in, in, in harmony with the community, a highway that carries few, fewer, smaller and cleaner trucks. And I can explain a little bit more about that vision. And also um, that the BQE is part of a broader um, uh, highway network that um, many communities have really sought to um, develop a new uh, vision for. So we, we really thought it was important to start that process. So extending the structural life is, um, is something that uh, the, um, a group of very um, talented engineers, um, we charged them with um, finding us solutions that could preserve the structure of the BQE for at least 20 years um, without a teardown, without any, um, um, you know, um, 
without any uh, construction means that would really impair or uh, cause harm on the nearby community. So we have developed a strategy where through um, our preventative maintenance, um, through basically, and I'll, and it, it, it sort of boils down to a few key steps. One, we're gonna stop, and we've already stopped using salt um, to de-ice the um, roadway because when you combine salt with water, um, you get corrosion and corrosion is what really undermines the um, structure itself. So the preservation method that this team of experts arrived at was a way to stop water infiltration because if you can stop that water from leaching into the structure um, and prevent that from combining with the salt, then we're really able to slow down the rate of corrosion. Um, that is also, doesn't mean you can stop doing all the ongoing maintenance, um, but um, this was um, you know, a, a great finding that we thought would give us at least a couple decades to come up with a more permanent community-based solution. So our phase one install installation will happen um, starting next year, we're already working up the plans and, and Paul Schwartz can talk to the, some of those details um, after the presentation. Um, and then a second key piece of this is really understanding what is the state in real time of the structure. And so we um, have um, installed um, state of the um, state of, let me just read, we have installed um, state-of-the-art technology um, and place sensors at locations to give us information on how the structure is behaving and provide that real-time monitoring. These sensors have already been installed. We are continuing to add more um, as we go and we will continue to get that feedback from those um, sensors so we can see how the structure is behaving at any given time and see if there's anything sort of aberrant or um, you know, something that causes um, concern. And then the tooling conversion. So I'm sure you are all acutely aware. Um, we reduced the BQE from three to two lanes in each direction um, from Atlantic to the Brooklyn Bridge approximately. Um, this happened um, on August 30th, actually the full implementation happened, you know, the, the, the Monday and Tuesday following the 30th, um, just because of, <laughs> it seemed to rain every night. Um, and this was a key recommendation from the BQE expert panel by removing the outermost lane. The goal of this conversion is to um, minimize the wear and tear on the structure. Um, we learned um, or, or there was a finding that um, without an intervention like this, we would not be able to um, have trucks travel on the highway beyond 2026. So that would have meant a full closure um, of the, this portion of the BQE for trucks. And, and that would be a significant um, issue for the highway, for circulation and for the communities. So um, as part of that, and we have um, Dan Schack from uh, Sam Schwartz to talk about the planning that went behind the conversion um, and the ongoing monitoring that is involved um, and which we seek your continuous um, feedback um, to sort of you know, monitor on the ground conditions because this is all sort of happening in real time um, you know, obviously when we went out to uh, do the conversion, it was still sort of late August. And so, you know, school hadn't been back in session. And I'm sure as all of you are acutely aware, uh, since school has come back and, and city workers have come back on Monday, um, definitely we're seeing, you know, more traffic volumes. So um, let me pass this over to Dan. Um, and in the meantime, maybe since I've gone through the first two sections fairly quickly, maybe pause for a minute and see if anybody has any questions or comments so far. Well, there's one There's one from Linda DeRosa. Linda, do you wanna speak? Linda? Hi there. 
Hello, Hi. everyone. Hi. I actually uh, wanted to wait till the end of the presentation to speak, but I just thought I'd chime in to let Sid know that I, I did want to speak. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank we'll you. Sid, we'll put, we'll put, Sid, we'll John, I have one quick question. Go ahead. In the, you, your presentation tonight is very much almost identical to the one that was circulated before the stakeholders conference with Commissioner Gutman. And when you talked about in that original presentation in the PowerPoint, when you talked about the sensors, weight sensors, you wrote there that the timeline was it said already installed preliminary results by August. That's not there anymore. Are there preliminary results? Yes, and I can um, actually, um, this is where I'll turn it over to Paul because um, there was a lot more information to share about um, the sensors than would be um, you know, sort of fitting in a slide. So Paul, do you wanna talk about um, where we are with the sensors? Sure. So good evening, everyone. Um, we've installed, we, so we're in the process of installing a bunch of sensors and we've done it in a few different ways. Uh, the first thing we did was we did uh, just a thermal scan which is fairly new technology to see how that compared to some of the previous scans we did. Um, and some of the results of that weren't great. That's what we got in August. So it wasn't extremely conclusive, uh, but we are going forward and we're installing a, a small segment of some fiber, octa, fiber optic uh, sensors that have some other uh, equipment on there. Uh, and that will be going in now um, through that May-ish date. So we could evaluate whether this is a good path forward to roll out to the rest of the structure. So that's what's going on at the moment. Thank what, you. What are, what are the sensors checked for? If they're infrared, what are they checking for? Well, so the infrared ones, which I said we didn't have a great result with, was supposed to give us a better idea of um, the whether there are delaminations underneath the riding surface or the concrete surface. But given the amount of asphalt that's on the structure at certain points, it was inconclusive. So instead, the fiber optics, which are going to go in, uh, and we're testing a setup of that now, will give us some of that baseline information as to how the structure is behaving, um, you know, the deflection, the acceleration, just the movement of the structure. Uh, and as uh, Jamie had mentioned before, that will give us insight in real time as to something is out of parameter. That's the goal uh, of putting these in. So we have a better uh, handle uh, up, you know, up to the minute on, on what's going on there. Uh, Sid, I have a question. John, do? Go ahead, John. Uh, yes. This technology that you're installing, has it been demonstrated to be effective any place else? Is there some system that has been in place, place that we can learn from? Or is this the first time this technology is being tried? No, fiber optic technology um, is something that is become more standard in the industry. Um, it, it is used in other, it's been used in other applications around the world. Um, so we're just bringing that over now into this structure. So what happens if you find, uh, if you get a reading that is problematic, what happens? Well, whenever you get a reading, um, it gets looked at. And if it's something that is out of parameters, it gets looked at by the engineers to see if they can understand why and what's going on. And, 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 uh, and what about the community notification? Is there something else that should follow when you get a reading that is problematic? Well, we want to certainly assure you that we want to work through the proper steps, right? Just because you get a reading, um, you know, you want to vet it. You want to make sure that it's accurate, that it's reasonable, that it's not a false alarm. So um, if there is any sort of major um, uh, steps that has to be taken, uh, we would notify the community. Obviously, we would notify the public if we were impacting the travel way or if something had to go, something had to be put in place. Um, we would take the necessary responses and steps in the event of an emergency, obviously, and then do all the proper notifications. Um, we, we do have a track record for doing that. It would be beneficial if, the community board could understand the steps that you just described, but thank you. You're welcome. 
you know, there are there are other questions. Some of them have to do with the overall project. Some of them have to do with specifically. One of the questions is about whether they're mo you're monitoring uh, uh, the air in the air quality and noise levels. Is that something that that you're doing? Uh, currently, we are not. This is um, that's something that you um, you would do noise monitoring during construction, um, and you would we follow the you know DEP guidelines for that. But we are not currently doing any noise or air monitoring as part of this project. Sid, it's Zero Scala. Can I ask a yeah. question? Sure, go ahead. Uh, what when 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 you find something that possibly is uh, happening to the sensors? Would you immediately mitigate that issue? Uh, basically, what I'm getting at is uh, occasionally the bed of the highway deteriorates on a regular basis. And we, the community who surround it, feel we, the, the vibrations much stronger when that is happening. The DOT has um, regularly or irregularly, I may say, fixed or mitigated some of the potholes and things that happen. When you get something with a red flag, will you immediately go ahead and repair that location? We would certainly have to look and assess what that red flag was and what the cause of it was. Um, if it's a pothole, that's something that we could address fairly easily. Well, specifically, there is an area, just so I could, I don't want to get that specific, but there is an area of depression under the Columbia Bridge on the, when the highway makes its approach up to the Brooklyn Bridge. That location is notorious for having major issues and causing major vibrations. Maybe your sensors, are your sensors at least in that vicinity to sort of uh, get a reading on that? So we've not rolled out the full program yet. As I had mentioned before, we're just in the infancy. We're, we're rolling out a test section um, to see how effective it is and see if this is something we want to roll out further. Um, what I'll do is I'll take it back to the team so that if we do roll it out further, that could be a section that we want to highlight and monitor a little more closely. I would, I would seriously encourage you. That has always been a, a, a our, the community neighbors and all of us have always found that when that is, there is an issue there, the vibrations increase dramatically. Um, and I would, I would also ask that you do look into the, the air and noise pollution and just not leave it at vibrations. I think we all are suffering from that also. Thank you. Uh, Doreen, you, Doreen, yeah. you want to yeah, you, Doreen. Yeah. Thanks, Sid. Um, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have a few questions. Why would we wait to fix this? I wrote this in the chat. This at a time when the federal government is gearing up for a massive permanent solution for just this person purpose. Two, we put Band-Aids on this problem for decades already. It seems stupid to push this can down the road for yet another 20 years seems wrong. Three, our local streets are now full with massive trucks um, besides all the construction that's going on. Has no, no one noticed this this week? It's appalling, especially in the Cobble Hill area where I need a tunnel to redirect these trucks going over the Verrazano. The tunnel under Fourth Avenue would pay for itself. Where is that initiative? Um, great questions, Doreen. Um, so on the question of, um, you know, and we, we did, you know, when we when when uh, the mayor and, and Commissioner Gutman made the announcement, we did hear, um, you know, some of some similar um, comments about, you know, this isn't, um, you know, why is this, you know, just a 20 year fix? Where's the big plan? Where's the big vision? And, and we understand, but, you know, this 20 year fix is not, um, with all due respect, kicking the can down the road. This is, um, you know, everyone is enormously concerned about the safety and stability of the structure. They're also concerned that, you know, you want to have a, um, a vision for the structure that, um, you know, most folks that the community um, can get behind. And I think that um, the, the purpose of launching the community-based scoping process this fall um, is just that, um, that we have a, a consultant on board that we will be working closely with um, to engage not only the folks who live 
around the cantilever section, but along um, you know, the rest of the highway and to come up with um, design recommendations and solutions that can ultimately be implemented within um, a realistic time frame. So 20 years may seem like a long time, but in reality, we know with complex projects between um, the regulatory approvals and um, environmental approvals and funding and financing, um, you know, you quickly run that time out. So it's, it, we, we believe it's critically important that we have this visioning process that the 20 year preservation buys us the time to go through, let's say this two year planning process and then use the remaining time for implementation and the preservation, it's, it's, I mean, it's not a cheap fix either. And we will certainly tap into federal funding for that. Um, but, um, you know, I, and the last piece I wanna mention is that, um, you know, assembly member Simon and has, you know, drafted legislation where, um, you know, there would be a new authority created who could actually sort of divide, who, who could bridge the gaps between the various jurisdictions and who could actually execute and implement a project that you know, covers city jurisdiction, state jurisdiction, and so many communities and so many complex issues. So that's really the sort of big picture that we are um, driving towards. Yeah, and then, I, I, in, sorry. I mean, I, I think it's important. One of the issues, I mean, I, and it's clearly coming up, is that we, we are aware of what's going, that's, that's this is starting. It's the beginning of a process. The, the, what, we're, what I'm immediately concerned about, frankly, is what mitigation can be done. Obviously, there's been a tremendous increase of traffic through Brooklyn Heights and, and, uh, and Cobble Hill and, and Carroll Gardens from people who are trying to find ways around the highway. I think that, that you know, I, I know there were supposed to be traffic agents there for some period of time. Is something being more done to help with that? Has the police been involved at all with any enforcement? And and lastly, given that the truck traffic is so bad and so, you know, it would seem to me that the, the ongoing air quality and noise uh, uh, monitoring should take place now and not wait for more complaints. Or are we going to have to call 311 to, to make the complaints to get that done? So maybe um, I can, um, maybe we can talk about um, the monitoring and the TEAs. Um, and of course, we can go back to these um, previous slides if it's helpful for anyone. But you know, since the conditions are out there now, um, you know, uh, you you may have driven it or or seen it for yourself. Um, we we do um, have um, we have. Uh, executed on the um, traffic management measures that we discussed at the original outreach meeting a couple weeks ago, um, including the VMS, the messaging and marketing plan. And then of course, you're, you're talking about the monitoring effort between the TEAs and the on-site personnel. Um, we had, um, we, we did put all those resources out um, at the key locations and key intersections the first two weeks of the project installation. Um, again, the first week, and we're just getting reports back um, on the first couple of weeks in terms of the data and findings with keeping in mind the first couple of weeks are probably a little atypical because drivers are still getting used to the new traffic patterns. The first week, we also dealt with, um, you know, some of the se severe events from um, Hurricane Ida. Um, and then, of course, this week, we have kept the monitors and the TEAs out um, beyond the initial two-week period because we, we do understand that traffic is getting heavier, um, you know, as um, people are going back to school and going back to work. So um, we can, um, and maybe Dan, this is a good time to kind of jump in and talk about the um, monitoring plan and also sort of our initial observations, but 
um, importantly, we do want to hear from you in terms of you know where you are seeing specific um, issues, um, and you know because these locations, whether it's the TEAs or whether it's our folks, you know, uh, you know, monitoring real time conditions, these are not fixed. We want to adjust them as as time goes on. Um, so I'll, I'll pass the baton to Dan, and then we can kind of open it up for, for more um, observations and comments from, from folks on the call. Sure, uh, Jimmy, just go over the, the monitoring plan. Yeah, I think just okay. we should talk, because I think it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like this is probably most top of mind to the committee right now. Well, I, th I think the committee has three, you know, three, three ways we want to look at this. Well, we want to look at, uh, you know, what the what the construction issues are with the plan, mm -hmm. what, what's, uh, what the mitigation concerns are, and finally, the alternate planning and input for the big plan and for the future. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, I actually wrote my notes down about this, about in what order, uh, and I had considered letting, you know, discussing it with DOT about, because obviously the, the, I, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing emails from uh, people in Carroll Gardens and, and uh, uh, in Cobble Hill, and I'm also seeing from Boren Hill that that uh, Boich, uh, that Bond Street is being used as a car. Bond Street is being used as a corridor. Uh, the problem is Third Avenue is is uh, uh, broken up because they're putting a gas main in. So you have a lot of traffic that's migrating all around, given that they're they're trying to find an easy way. And they're using all the potential alternates, and they're very badly backed up. Now, I'll also add, you know, in the middle of this, he also had uh, Labor Day, and then two two days Jewish holidays when there was no school in session, and that lightened traffic a lot. And today and yesterday, because I actually look occasionally, look, I drove I drove back today from Staten Island, and it was a disaster. I mean, all and and I know all the alternates as well. And they all were they all were a disaster today, so you know I think we want to hear what the mitigate you know in order to mitigate you have to find what the problem is, uh, uh, and, and we we are getting lots of complaints we're seeing lots of complaints. Sid, um, I'm sorry. Well, Sid, you're being actually very kind. The fact is. Since the two lanes were implemented, we don't understand what is supposed to happen with that third lane of traffic. Where are those cars and trucks supposed to go? To date, they are now in the community board two district that is adjacent to the BQE. How are we supposed to understand and mitigate the issues with all of that additional traffic that is no longer going to be on the BQE, but is now going through the community. That's what I'm waiting to hear. Dan, do you want me to sure. jump in or do you want to speak to this? Well, maybe I just go over the, the uh, what's being done um, monitoring wise, Jimmy, just sure, um, yeah. so we're all kind of, you know, understanding what's happening. Um, so, the, the project is, everything's being very closely monitored. Um, first, starting with the JTMC, that's the, the traffic management center that DOT um, runs in partnership with uh, the state and MTA and, and Port Authority in Queens, where they monitor uh, travel times and, and uh, video feeds of, of all the, the uh, major roadways in the region. Um, in addition to that, uh, there's a field team that is out um, on the ground monitoring locations that you can't see remotely. So we've had staff out um, for, uh, I think it's like a 16 hours days uh, since the project went in uh, every day uh, in all the areas where we were concerned about possible impacts or where traffic could be diverted. Uh, this map on the left shows the, the general areas where people are monitoring. It's, as Jimmy said, it's not uh, exclusive to these. They'll, you know, rotate around and, and um, go to different areas if there are issues that are being observed or, or we're hearing about. Uh, so the staff is out there every day 
uh, watching the local streets. They're working closely with um, others at, at uh, DOT and other agencies to uh, watch uh, conditions on the highways themselves. If you want to go to the, the next slide, Jimmy. Thanks. Uh, there are also a team of TEAs um, out on site. They've been there since the first day, August 30th, that the project went in. Um, they're now they, they're they're flexible as well. So this map is just a, an example of where they uh, would have been. But they're out there every single day, and they move around based on real conditions. So they'll uh, shift from one location to another if there's an issue. Uh, someplace and and not an issue somewhere else. So they're um, at all the hotspots helping to move traffic and they're in regular communication um, with the DOT staff that are in charge of monitoring to make sure they're responding to and, and um, being located at the places with the, the most issues. So- um, but, 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 but that that, what you're talking about is very generic. If you have reduced from three to two lanes, there is a third of the conventional BQE traffic that yeah. is, how is that working? So what we're, these we're, also, we're also monitoring travel times on the BQE itself, um, all of the, the regional highways, mm -hmm. the, the Hugh Carey Tunnel and, and the bridges. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, we've been monitoring travel times on all the arterials in the area like Atlantic Avenue and other streets where um, there could be a detour of traffic in the area. It's, it's tough, you know, two weeks in, it's, I, we don't want to draw any conclusions. Things are still in flux and we're waiting Hearing for- you have monitors. Too. I don't know what those monitors do when all that traffic is presented. What are they authorized? What can they do? They can monitor. What happens after they monitor? So we, we're watching um, travel times as well on the highways and all of the local routes. And I, I just, I'll say, you know, two weeks in, we wouldn't draw any conclusions yet. But what we're seeing so far um, is uh, impacts of the project on the BQE itself, uh, for sure. The travel times have slowed down in both directions, approaching the, the two lane segment. Um, we have not, we are not seeing major impacts or uh, major detours of traffic onto the local streets. Uh, we're not seeing a big change in travel times on, uh, you know, Atlantic Avenue and Furman Street and other arterials um, that could be detour routes. So there are locations that have congestion issues. There are places where there were always issues and continue to be. Uh, we believe some of those have gotten a little bit exacerbated by the project, places like Old Fulton and, and Hamilton Avenue, just, just naming two examples. Uh, those are locations where we're monitoring more closely. Uh, we're working with DOT to look at what the travel times are there, what the volumes are, when the congestion occurs, what, what it is, if, what direction it's going in, where the vehicles are turning. And um, we'll be using that information to develop mitigations where possible. So looking at things like changing the signal timings, uh, changing some of the, the lane allocations, uh, you know, uh, left turn lane to a right turn lane, uh, various striping programs and things like that. So we want to, you know, two weeks in, we want to wait a little bit longer to see how things look when they've normalized um, and collect more data on what the volumes are like and what the impacts are like and then come up with measures wherever it's possible uh, to make things flow a little more smoothly. I, I, and, just, a, and, and, on, and on the TEAs, um, you know, we're working with the PD um, and, and our monitors. Um, and in fact, you know, when we get feedback from, um, you know, members of the community, um, we will ask PD to, let's say, move um, an agent from one location to another, um, you know, we're always trying to sort of right, right size or, or you know, um, trying to um, allocate the resources appropriately. Um, so this is somewhat of a dynamic situation. And, and you know, but again, if, if there's, a, you know, if there's a, a lot of traffic at an intersection and there's not a TEA there, please let us know. 
um, and we'll make sure it's it's on our list um, to follow up and address. So how, how do we? I have a we, question. How do, how do we do that? How do we do that? There at the end of the say, oh, sorry, this is Keith Bray. So at the end of the presentation, there is an email address that we have that you can send your request to. But obviously, Sid and other people in the committee, you know myself, you know Emily. If there's certain things you're seeing or you think you need to come to our attention, you should write me and Emily, and we will follow up on them and get back to you. Okay, so I, I have one. I have one other. You know, the report says that 15 to 25 percent of the trucks are overweight, and I know that when they did a a, a targeted enforcement uh, during the time when they were doing the uh, when they were doing the the they, when they were doing the report, right? They uh, 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 found uh, tr uh, trucks were overweight by as much as a hundred thousand pounds. And I want to know. I know, I know the uh, uh, idea of the robotic giving him tickets afterwards, but by that point, the damage is being done. Is there anything that's going to be uh, uh, done to try to prevent that so people don't? They, they're not traveling at the only time that's free to travel between 12 and 5, significantly overweight, causing damage to the roadway and to people's homes. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the way in motion sensors are, are what you're talking about, and, and they're part of our presentation. Um, they are um, an important part of not just um, finding, um, you know, trucks that are um, it basically illegal, right, and, and, and harming our, our highway and communities, um, but also acting as a deterrent, because, you know, no matter how many um, police officers you put out on the highway, I mean, there's only so much they can do in terms of volumes. Um, and so that legislation is awaiting the signature of uh, Governor Hochul. Um, and, you know, um, you know, we know she is, um, you know, still getting up to speed. So I don't have exact timing on when she should sign, but I think we want to encourage everyone, you know, if you can please advocate for the passage of that bill, it is absolutely essential. That is the one, um, you know, real tool we have to, um, you know, really, you know, creating enforcement against those overweight trucks. Sid, it's zero. I had a question uh, on the monitoring, uh, are, is the DOT also including monitoring for accidents and for uh, um, safety measures generally? Because the streets that the traffic is now being now routed being to has an enormous amount of bikers Biker now, and it's a lot more congested with biking. And also, will the, the reduction of those two lanes, uh, are you checking to see that that'll mitigate less accidents? Well, I certainly hope so. Since the at the corner of a, the Atlantic and uh, uh, the at the Atlantic and BQE average four accidents a week and 180 something a year, so obviously, you know they, they know the numbers and they do monitor them. And as I think I've once said, is that there actually are is a you can monitor them yourself. From the PD actually shows uh, accident reports showing location, time of day. And, and, and what the severity of the incident is. So I can promise you that DOT is monitoring this. Thank you. That's correct. It, it's, we, are, we are monitoring that closely and, and safety, uh, I don't know, Jamie, if you wanna to jump to that, that one slide with the, uh, the 300 crashes a year. Sure. Um, you know, sorry, safety. I'm jumping around. I wanted no, to sorry. show <laughs> folks the automated enforcement slide. Yeah. Okay, um, oops. Uh, it was like a couple before this. Yep. Uh, what, what, yeah, so, uh, you know, Jamie was saying, uh, you know, the real driver for this was reducing the weight on the structure to preserve it, uh, but we wanted to use the opportunity to address some other issues on the BQE, and safety was is one of them. the big ones. There's been a persistent issue here, uh, this stretch of the BQE, just from the, um, the Brooklyn Bridge to Atlantic Avenue, was uh, looking back at 2019, the last kind of normal year, uh, was a pretty high crash roadway with 300 crashes in that year. Um, aside from the safety aspects of that, it certainly affects travel time and reliability of, of the road. Um, and if you jump one ahead, Jimmy. So I, I, I'm sure everyone here is familiar with these locations. Two of the, the 
Uh, most unsafe were the entry ramps at Atlantic Avenue, where uh, cars coming onto the BQ were stop controlled uh, with no acceleration lane at all, really, um, and pretty poor visibility. So these these were uh, you know dangerous entries to the highway that the two lane um, project. If you go ahead, one more. Uh, oh, sorry, one, one more. They, I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to go into every, every uh, detail, but the two lane uh, striping allows these to be addressed. So just looking at the uh, Queensbound direction, northbound, um, and it's the same situation in the other direction. What was that stop control with no merge at all um, and, and poor visibility is now a uh, standard acceleration lane highway entry ramp uh, where the vehicles can get up to speed before they merge in to the next lane on the highway. So we are monitoring uh, safety and crashes along uh, the corridor, certainly everywhere that we changed and, and hoping that we see a, a big reduction in, in uh, the numbers I, here with these I use, the, I use the entrance going towards Staten Island at exit 27 today, and it was improved tremendously. And I know that there've been a couple of fatalities at that, uh, ex, at, at that entrance. We, in fact, at this committee, discuss this in June, that specific, those, those two specific entrances. And, and hopefully uh, uh, this will help and make it safer, but it's gonna back up. I mean, traffic is backed up and there's, uh, especially going towards the Brooklyn Bridge. And you know, uh, 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 Commissioner Bray knows that, that uh, I actually look every, pretty much every morning, I take a look at the traffic cam and, and, it's, and it's just, it's, it's much worse than it. it it's always bad during rush hour, but it's it's been bad during the day. And 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 as someone pointed out, it's being a it seems to be problematic even now at one o'clock in the morning. So, so we'll, have, we'll have to see what's happening and have to keep monitoring it. Um. So sorry uh, to jump around, but um. Do we have, I, I want to just, um, you know, adhere to the sort of um, agenda you had in mind. Um, so definitely on the traffic side, um, you know, we, we still want to, you know, um, gather all the data and observations, you know, at least for the next week or two um, before taking concrete measures, um, you know, to really address the um, you know, any of these delays that are attributable to the two lane. And we, you know, we've got the, um, you know, the email address that you can send your observations or concerns. Um, we also want to make sure that we spend time on the um, rehab elements or the, the, the near term repairs. Um, is that, uh, so I don't want to skip to that unless there are other questions um, remaining on this previous section. Mr. Myers, we have a list of uh, questions, requested questions in the chat. Would you like us to read them? Um, I believe you're on mute, Mr. Myers, but maybe we could start with Brian Howell as he is a board member. No, I just, I just, I unmuted me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> would, you, uh, would you like us to read the list of questions? Well, let, let Mr. Howell, why don't you go ahead, Mr. Howell? Brian Howell, are you on the line still? Uh, yes, but I don't have a question. Okay. All right. All right so, you know, so what, obviously, we, we have the mitigation concerns clearly have not been met. We have lots of questions about them and, and how and, and ongoing. The construction issues, which are the issues of what's going to go, the immediate construction, we probably should talk about now. And then finally, which I think is really a lot of people have questions, is about the alternate planning and input so that we could get into a plan that that uh, rationalizes the entire corridor, whatever that rationalization ultimately is. So why don't you spend a few minutes talking about the construction, the near fear practical near camera. Sure. Um, Paul, sure. You take over the section. Absolutely. So as many of you are probably very aware, um, we started the work on, on the Hick Street wall uh, fall of last year. Uh, we are getting very close to the ends of that work. Um, that is basically rebuilding 
uh, or breathing new life into this wall um, that will get us to certainly that 20 year time frame that, that we had referred to earlier. Um, so we are on track to uh, finish that this fall and that exit ramp was open actually right about August 29th or so. Um, this upcoming year, uh, calendar year 22, we are planning some major work on spans four and 34 of the eastbound or Queensbound roadway. Um, those will require a weekend closure and some partial closures. And this will be to uh, address two of the spans that um, from our, from our, our models have deteriorated a little bit further along than the other spans on the roadway. So these are the two that we're pulling out to address quicker. Um, and that's part of the goal of keeping tr trucks or on the road beyond 2026. Um, this work, obviously, that I just spoke about, it will be, you'll see, but there's also a bunch of work that you won't see necessarily. This is all the support work and that, that needs to be done. Uh, to keep the structure operating. Um, so what you're seeing here is some work that we're going to be doing at Jerolam and Street Abutment. That'll be part of the span four and 34 work next calendar year, as well as around the Clark Street fan plant, uh, where there's some flag work or we call flag work repair work to the concrete, reinforced concrete that it needs to be done. Uh, and again, we're, cup, we're, we're this won't be as impactful for the community. It's interior, lane closures will be more, will be minor um, and will be part of that 2022 effort. Um, so the structural work obviously will continue um, beyond this, right? Um, we spoke about the preservation effort and what that would look like. Um, and anything that we do will follow, you know, the proper environmental protocols, whether that's NEPA, SECRA, um, ULERPs that are required. So all that's going to be done as we do on any of our major projects. Uh, we do have some tentative work scheduled for what we call the, the four crossings. You may have heard that term before, uh, Old Fulton, Washington, Prospect and Sand Streets that are up along the BQE a little bit north of the triple cantilever section. Um, that work we're looking at closely through a preservation lens as well. So we're um, still evaluating whether that'll be a sort of rehabilitation or a preservation effort um, and, and that so that, that's something that we're working towards this fall. Um, and we are looking to target that sometime in 2023. Okay, and, and, and let, me, let me, before, Doreen has been patient, I believe. Could you, uh, Doreen, do you wanna say something about the future plans? Doreen? Yes, I uh, said, I do. Um, let's see. Well, we participated in a five-year community-based planning process five years ago. There was incredible participation and agreement during that extensive planning process. Why are we redoing it? <laughs> These were the solutions from that planning process. There, the community agreed on a tunnel down 4th Avenue to relieve the BQE and our streets from heavy trucks. You've done this now, the two lanes, each direction in the most vulnerable places. Uh, to fix it in place, change tolling on the Verrazano. You have down two of these three issues we identified and the solutions that, you know, I'm still pushing that the tunnel should be filed today to get the infrastructure funds. And why not now after such an incredible community planning process done such a short time ago, are we redoing a community planning process? I mean, it seems that uh, there were, uh, there was a lot of commonality and consensus. I just feel like, again, <laughs> I, it just feels like a waste of time to, are we looking for different answers? Um, I, don't, I don't know. Um, I think just a, an important note, um, and does this mean we should just go into the next section? Yeah, that's where we okay. are. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, part of, um, so this, I completely understand where you're coming from, Doreen. Um, and, you know, just to be clear, the, the visioning plan is intended to be um, a, a plan for, you know, the BQE all the way from Staten Island to Queens. So, um, you know, there's been certainly a lot of focus, attention, and, you know, oftentimes consensus on, you know, let's say, um, you know, some of the elements that you um, spoke of, and that's great. And we're not going to necessarily need to 
um, completely redo the wheel. Um, there's going to be portions of the highway um, and, and we've actually um, asked the consultant to kind of break it up into typologies, right? So there's portions of the highway that are, are um, sort of trenched, right? And there's been lots of conversations um, in the past about, you know, decking those portions. Um, you know, there's also been conversations even recently as part of the two lane conversion where, um, you know, I've heard folks mention um, at least a couple times, you know, why can't we narrow the BQE to two lanes further down to, um, you know, by the trench, um, you know, in the state portion. Um, so I think, you know, I, I hear you loud and clear. I think this community in particular has been well organized, has done a lot of past planning. Um, I, I am sensitive to that. I am also going to, because our um, process hasn't begun yet, this is really helpful feedback to get that, you know, the consultant should not go out and, you know, recreate the wheel. And, <laughs> um, you know, I think where there's already very good, um, you know, agreement on um, plans and concepts, let's sort of, um, you know, take, take those and, and build off of those if, if there is any you know, additional building we need to do. But then in other portions of the highway, um, maybe there's a little bit more organizing that needs to happen. Um, so, so that's really the, the idea. And I, I hope that um, addresses your concern a little bit. All right, are there, I don't see, I mean, are there any members of the Excuse community me. other than board member or, or board members not on the committee who have questions who have not been recognized? Yes, Seth, yes. Yeah. excuse yes. me, this is Carol Ann. Oh, hi, yes. Carol Ann. Sorry. Okay, can I, can, can I um, manage that part for you? Yes, please. Okay, great. Sid, Sid, I just have one more question about the fact it would, the, the, the DOT consultant, who, uh, if, the, if the DOT will share that information, who are the DOT consultants? And my, I sent a message in chat we did get quite a few uh, imaginative plans when we went through it in the past from various architectural firms. What is the overall picture? I, I see the need to clear the corridor, the DOT consultant, the vision plan, but I don't hear something about who are all gonna be involved and listen to. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it just gonna be DOT organized or are you reaching out to other, um, other parties who may have very interesting and imaginative plans that will benefit the total community. So the DOT is, so the consultant we've engaged is a, um, a firm called uh, a WSP. And um, I believe they, there was a representative from WSP at the previous um, uh, outreach meeting. Um, they have um, a sub consultant on board, public works partners. Um, and one of the things that, um, is clearly in their scope that I've, you know, uh, you know, emphasized is the fact that there are very creative, imaginative plans um, that were prepared by um, other designers and architects. And so, um, you know, we need to, you know, make sure that all the past plans are um, recognized. They're, you know, sort of given their fair. Um, the sort of fair review. Um, but we're also going to put some, you know, if, if we focus on the BQE uh, triple cantilever section, for example, we're also going to start to put some rigor behind it, meaning, okay, we've got, you know, let's say 20 years, the clock is starting. Um, you know, what are, you know, the sort of different impacts related to some of these alternatives? And then what is a sort of um, implement to, implementability, um, you know, within a, a time frame that really is going to be, you know, um, bookended by a, a 20 year window, right? Because we don't have forever. Um, and, and so this is about getting something um, out there that, you know, we can start the clock, you know, begin the regulatory process, begin the environmental process, get the funding and financing and, and get it really, you know, um, it, it's almost like the plan for Brooklyn Bridge Park. You needed to have a community vision for um, an entity to execute on it. So, so that's the goal. 
And do you know when the next meeting is going to be? Is there, has a meeting been scheduled? For the, no, not yet. We, um, we have um, a couple, uh, we have a couple of um, small items that we're going to work out with the consultants um, by the end of the week. And then we're going to, you know, start to map out um, um, the, the meeting schedule um, and it will be robust, um, including, you know, civic organizations, um, different entities, elected officials, and of course, agencies from across jurisdictions. Hi, Sid. May I, so, some folks have been waiting very patiently. May I start reading off the list of names? Go right ahead. Great. Brian Howard. Brian? Okay. Ryan already spoke. John, he indicated he wanted to speak again. Um, I want to speak again also. Yeah, yes, John. But can we get a couple other people who haven't spoken yet? Well, let's, let's, um, well, let's, Julia. Let's get, let's get, let's get people we haven't heard before. Julia Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks, Carolyn. Sure. Um, so I want to echo what both Doreen and Ciro were talking about with regard to the, the long-term planning and long-term visioning for the BQE, especially at our section, the tri triple cantilever. Um, this note, this bigger, better plan in front of us outlines a singular vision and illustrative concept for the BQE. I think we're at the point where re we really need DOT or its consultant to look at all of the other concepts that were proposed by uh, architects, community organizations, and break them down. You know, not look at one individually and throw it all away because one component of that concept may be deemed as infeasible, but to look at the ideas behind the proposals and the visions. You know, they accomplish not just uh, transportation vision, but some of them accomplish public space visions, access visions. Um, environmental sustainability um, goals. So, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of other larger components to this project that, you know, right right now it's, it makes sense to put a bandaid on it, to, to extend the useful life of the existing BQE, but there's been a lot of planning already. And, and there was a blue ribbon commission that was um, instituted and, we didn't really ever get results of why certain components of plans that were proposed were um, viable or not viable. You know, there was no real work that was presented to us. It's all happening in a black box. You know, you, you guys came to us and said, oh yeah, all these other plans, well, it just doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Can you break Doreen's, you know, the Fourth Avenue tunnel? like? We need to better understand all of the components, like the um, the connectivity down to the Brooklyn uh, Heights waterfront from uh, the uh, the promenade level. Like there there are lots of components that are that are really great, and we would like answers to each of the components that have already been put forth in a sort of as a sort of precursor to the long term visioning session. I think that would be helpful rather than starting from scratch. Thank you. This church. I was wondering if there was a response to that. Um, if there's none, Brian Howell, you up? I think you're unfrozen now. Thank you very much. Yes, I hope I am too. Um, I I want to just note that you know if this process had been done on time, we would probably have three lanes in each direction of highway along the waterfront, and that. I honestly think that we have benefited from this project being delayed over and over again as we watch, you know, as we watch uh, our climate change, um, as we watch uh, uh, what people want in their neighborhoods, or not what they want, but being able to say what they want for their neighborhoods changes. Um, we've learned that we want less highway uh, and that we don't want devastating floods or other, you know, a, a warmer climate. And uh, I know that there's a lot of 
complaints that this process has gone on a long time and nothing's been done. And I think that that honestly works to our advantage and, and not to, uh, you know, not to have DOT give themselves a pat on the back. But I think the longer that this goes on, the, the, like, the greater likelihood that we will not rebuild the highway there. And that is, uh, I think, would be the best for the city. Thank you. Taya, who's next? Rudy Stanton. And after Judy, Linda DeRosa. Okay, we, we, we're not hearing Judy, Linda, are you on? Here I am, sorry, I muted myself. And um, I just have a question as to the governance structure that Kavanaugh and Simon are proposing. Exactly what are they um, proposing? What type of, it's gonna be state controlled, city controlled? Will it be like the local development corp that began Brooklyn Beach Parks um, development or more like the Brooklyn Beach Park Development Corp? What exactly do they have in mind? Um, I think I can talk about it at, at a high level from from what I recall of the of the bill. Um, it was really intended to be sort of an umbrella govern gov um, entity, like an authority that would um, sort of cut through the various jurisdictions. So you know, obviously, you almost need sort of the mediator going in between the city and the state and others. Um, and so this authority would have the broad powers to um, implement, to fund and finance, um, and you know, sort of bridge all the jurisdictional gaps. Like the ESDC? Y yes, in a way, right, that type of authority. There's not a whole lot of community participation in the ESDC. Well, I think this, the goal of this vision plan is that the community drives the 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 big idea is that ultimately the the authority uh, or this entity will be charged to um, execute and and again this is a, a this is a bill that you know it, it's it hasn't been voted on I mean it's still you know a draft um, you know and hopefully it gains traction in the coming years but that's the concept. Hey Linda. Hi. Okay, well, thank you for this meeting. Um, so my question comes from uh, Willowtown and broader Brooklyn Heights neighbors who are concerned that lane closures and waterproofing, uh, in fact, uh, won't buy us 20 years on this road, nor should we look at this plan as an inspired goal. So, you know, our communities, including many on the BQE team, have for a long time worked on um, plans innovative plans to uh, look towards the future for this highway. And we are hoping that the DOT will include some of these plans in their next step. I know that there's a bigger, better uh, plan uh, group that we're trying to set up with stakeholders. So I'm hoping that we can get a timeline going sooner than later. Is there a timeline set for us to start to get involved for that planning process as other Folks have mentioned, Doreen and Juliet have mentioned that we've done a lot of work already. And I think if we start to show that there's a bigger, broader plan than just lane closures and uh, waterproofing, that will help also mitigate the concerns the community has when they see we're also looking at a bigger picture that potentially won't be 20 years down the road. So when can we expect that timeline to start really engaging with you? As you can see, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of excitement. <laughs> there's a lot of yes. excitement to do it. So can we um, start like when? Uh, I know I, I, I want to make sure I want to get this scope, this sort of scoping process with the consultant behind us at the end of this week. Um, when I talk to them, so it's um, fall. It's the fall it's meeting, I think. Definitely, um, we will come up with a schedule by the end of the month. But I would say, you know, if you can, you know, send, you know, through the BQE email address, send any, you know, background information, if you have a, you know, any context, anything that is, you know, important for us to begin considering, not only in terms of past or current plans, um, but, you know, sort of, 
um, ways to engage, right? If they're, you know, because we want to start to um, sort of map out all of the community stakeholders, um, who we should begin talking to. I mean, obviously, it's going to be fairly complex because we have to start to think about this for the entire quarter, not just the cantilever section. So um, we want to start to really understand who the players are and who we need to talk to. Well, if it do, all due respect, the cantilever is is the thing for us. So <laughs> we, we got to start <laughs> there. This yes, is sir. impacted. Okay. We've got no, to no, no, absolutely, there. absolutely. Okay. You all are probably the most organized. Okay, um, I'm, yeah. I'm calling time. Uh, uh, John, you want to say one thing, and then we're going to move on to the next subject. Thank you so much, Sid. Um, I would be remiss if I did not announce that this project started a quarter century ago when the state came to Community Board 2 to tell us that the cantilever would, was 50 years old and at the end of its useful lifespan. And we began planning 25 years ago to replace this cantilever when it was six piers and no Brooklyn Bridge Park. And we said, you can use the area over the piers for the alternate roadway, either temporary or permanent. All of John, a sudden, Brooklyn Bridge John, Park John, happened. John, John you know, said, history is not built up to Furman Street. We need that space for the cantilever. Okay. And then we were told Brooklyn Bridge Park is going to Furman Street. So this project has boxed itself in over 25 years. And now we are dealing with an issue that is frankly going to be extremely problematic to carry out. And I'm hearing we're doing new surveys to find out. We had started this process 25 years ago and okay, got John, nothing from it. John, thank you. We have a couple. We have a couple of folks who've been waiting for a really long time. Okay, who um, are they? Patrick Kalaki, committee okay. member, Bill Stein, Alexandria Sika, April Sombon, Nick DeSantis, Janet, Bohan Angelov, Louis Benalva, Andrew Rose Gregory, Mark Stern. Um, okay. If everyone can keep their comments really short. Let's please let's go let's go through them. Okay, I'll I'll start. This is Patrick. Um, I the the lane reduction element of this plan is kind of like the key element that threads its way through everything. It makes things better now. You know, fewer fewer uh, vibrations. It's it's a big part of extending the life of the uh, structure, and it's also kind of the vision. Uh, you know, Brian alluded to it as you know, a more, a more sustainable transportation system, a vision for reducing roadway capacity. Um, however, we are stuck without, for the next two years, one of the key tools to make it really uh, work, which is congestion pricing. And I guess, so I just wanna sort of make that statement, but also ask DOT, is there some way to have some, you know, some uh, element of congestion pricing. Maybe, you know, you even, you even have on slide 18, the, uh, the hope uh, to move traffic to the, to the battery tunnel. Is there some way to, you know, charge, charge less for the battery tunnel and maybe start charging fee people for using the BQA? And that's my well, question. I can answer that very simple. The <laughs> congestion pricing is in the a purview of the MTA. That's where it is. And there they have been, uh, there's been a lot of pressure on them to move on it faster and they keep delaying it. And uh, anything, I mean, that's, that's, that's since it's a state entity, that's something that Sen uh, Senator Kavanaugh and uh, Assembly Member Simon should be able to help us with. But that is a, a uh, unfortunately a uh, state function. And as to the battery tunnel, obviously most of that stuff's gonna have to wait for the next mayor. Right. So I, I understand that and I, I, I won't make any comment related to the MTA, but but DOT is the main transportation planner in the city and it's a it's a fundamental tool. But I hear what you're saying, Sid, you know, that that's that's the that's the legal structure. OK, right. thank you. Who's on next? Who's up next? 
Bill Stein. Hi, uh, I just want to point out that the traffic that comes off the Brooklyn Bridge and loops around down to Old Fulton Street to make the left turn onto the BQE West, um, has that, that traffic is worse than ever. And that's with dedicated, that's with two dedicated TEAs at mid -Aw Street and, and the uh, exit ramp on Camden Plaza West and two dedicated TEAs at the intersection of the ramp at Old Fulton Street. So, uh, and by the way, those TEAs leave at 10 p.m. The traffic doesn't leave at 10 p.m. So um, I just want to once again um, add that the direct connections from the Brooklyn Bridge to the BQE West and the Manhattan Bridge to the BQE in both directions were that were part of the original DOT plan and also were in the expert panel report that those direct connections would make a world of difference to, um, you know, in, in conjunction with the reduction of the lane to two. Um, and that those direct connections should not be forgotten in as part of this 20-year uh, plan. Thanks. Thank you. Alexandria. Alexandria. Hi, Alexandria. Yeah. Okay. While we wait on Alexandria, April. Hi, sorry, it's Alexandria. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I basically just wanted to reiterate what Bill was saying um, that, you know, having these connections, which were going to take, um, take the uh, cars off of the local streets, um, not part of this initial plan, um, feels very challenging um, and, you know, just express concern that we are seeing the traffic building up. Okay, thank, thank you. you. April? Yes, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to get a little bit of clarity in regards to the proje projected um, structural repairs to the cantilever. I don't think it was really mentioned at the I beginning. Um, what it was mentioned at the beginning, um, what it will likely entail in terms of cost, time, and disruption. I know you guys are currently doing the two-year planning process, but um, can you provide um, sort of your long-term vision for this? Um, 20 years is certainly a really long time. And on Hicks Street, right by the wall, as you guys probably know, the DOT, you guys are doing a great job fixing up the wall, by the way, it looks great. And we're excited that it's gonna be completed this fall, but a semi truck tried to take a right-hand turn and it didn't work. Um, you know, bringing down um, a light lamp post, um, kids walk through that area to go to PS8. So I guess I just really wanna know um, your projected structural repairs to the cantilever, cost time, and um, when we can expect the next meeting. Um, so maybe I'll just kick off um, my initial response and then um, turn it over to Paul. Um, we are um, working out um, the steps, um, both procurement and um, funding and actual implementation of uh, the structural preservation now um, with the commitment to begin, um, you know, to have the work begin um, next year. Um, but it's really going to be, um, you know, a combination of sealing the joints on the wall, um, addressing drainage, dealing with the joints um, across the deck and then putting a sealant over the deck so you prevent water infiltration. Um, and so I think we will have more information. I mean, it, it sounds, I mean, it sounds like, oh, you're just sealing, you know, some of these um, joints. Um, but, you know, when you talk about a, a, a complex structure with 166 joints, um, you know, there's a little, there's a lot of details we have to figure out. And I don't know if Paul, you wanted to add to that at all. Uh, not too much. I mean, it's about right. Um, we know that the work next year will entail some late, nightly lane closures and will entail some weekend closures. Um, we've been pretty forthcoming about that. Um, but we are still planning out what the next phases will look like um, and what those impacts will be. And like we did with Hick Street and like we will do with uh, the plan work for next year, we'll, we'll be back out speaking to everybody here and explaining what our intentions are. And thank you for your compliment on Hick Street. 
Okay, Janet. Yes, hi. Uh, was there any thought given to adding support columns, vertical support columns to at least the southbound lane, which is the lower level, the closest level to the ground on that cantilever? Because right now it just seems like it's sticking out of a retaining wall. If you could add support columns beneath, you could go back to the three lanes and not have to wait 30 or 40 or 50 years to get a real fix. Yeah, so let me try to explain that. Um, the way the structure was built, it was designed a certain way to act a certain way. Um, so if I could, and I don't know how clear this would be, um, I do have this court in front of me. And what you've got basically is, if this is the support, this is the wall, um, what the structure wants to do, and this is very exaggerated, is bend this way, right? You've got trucks and traffic and, and weight, and it wants to bend in this direction. So therefore, um, the way the structure was designed was to resist that bending and keep it straight. Um, by putting a column under this side, you force the structure to want to do this. And that's the opposite direction to the way it was designed. And therefore, it doesn't currently have the, the, the structure, the steel, uh, the framework, if you will, the skeleton to allow that behavior. So it was something that we, we did look at, but it's not feasible in this case. What actually holds it up right now, currently? It's a combination of, of, of steel and concrete. It's reinforced concrete, the structure. But that's well with inside the retaining wall, nothing underneath the lanes, north or southbound lanes. No, there are. Well, there are no columns. You see no columns. When you look at it from Brooklyn, well, I know I you're winning, but when you look at it from Brooklyn Bridge Park, yeah. there are no support between northbound and southbound. We don't have lanes. time to do it in engineering. I know, but it's a critical question. Rather than waiting 100 years, you know, I'll be long gone. Something that can work and it's in within five years would be better. Yeah, so right. we, we do feel that preserving the structure as we've laid out will get us that 20 year time frame we've been asked to and allow us to engage on this, you know, the other community engagement that we've been talking about today. Okay, on deck is Bohan bon, bon, Angelov. I don't see it. Luis, Luis Penalva, Mark Stern. Here, can you hear me? And this is Mark, yes. I just wanted to ask, it could be applied to city streets because the overweight trucks are moving their streets. I can't, I can't hear him. Mr. Stern, could you type your question in the chat? Your connection is not good. Okay, will do. Is there anyone else? That's it. Okay, we'll get the question typed in and, and hopefully, and if anybody has a question that has not been answered, you know, they, you can uh, send it to the email address and uh, this part of the, of, of the agenda is uh, closed and we're going to the open restaurants non ULL. Sid, Sid, Sid and Sarah have one more request uh, just to ask the DOT if they would kindly plan to visit our committee on an agreed time no. on a regular basis to update us specifically on the big better plan and keep us abreast of it as they're going along so we could then give that information to the rest of the community would that be possible? I am sure we've had very good communication with DOT. They've been very good about coming to our meetings and the Commissioner Bray has, has, uh, has I know, worked with us very closely. And I can assure you that I'm not gonna let the BQE get away from us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, this is Maggie. I just wanted to ask the last question uh, before we leave. What is the uh, projected uh, cost of the cantilever repairs for next year? Uh, so I don't have that information at my fingertips for what we're looking to do next year, but uh, I'll get back to the team and Keith with that information. Thanks. Sure. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, DOT. Thank you for all the feedback. Thank you. And uh, the next presentation is on open restaurants on the open restaurants by Department of City Planning and Department of Transportation.
Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having us today. Uh, my name is Amrita Mahesh. I'm from DCP's Brooklyn office. I'm joined by Emily from DOT, and we'll both be presenting on the Open Restaurants proposal. Emily will go first with an overview of the program, and I'll go next to share a brief presentation on the text amendments. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen and uh, turn it over to Emily. I'll just let you know when to. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, great. Really want to see? Is that visible to everybody? Yes. Okay, great. Let's get started. Um, so my name is Emily Rick Kalman. I'm CB2 liaison at DOT's Brooklyn Borough Commissioner's Office. Um, you can switch to the next slide. Great. Um, So um, this presentation uh, will be DOT's, uh, will be presenting DOT's permanent uh, open restaurants program. One sec. So this program will look to balance at the many needs of the street and sidewalk, um, keeping restaurants and other users in mind. Finally, this program will take uh, what has worked and has not worked in the past, both pre-COVID and emergency, um, when developing this permanent future guidelines. Um, I want to make it clear that while this presentation will cover both sidewalk and roadway seating, uh, what DOT and DCP are asking for uh, the board tonight is your opinion on specific sidewalk cafe text amendments, um, which we'll get into a little bit later. Next slide. Um, as you already know, the street has had, um, the city has had street cafes before COVID, but far fewer of them. Um, the majority of programs were administered by what was formerly um, D Department of Con Consumer Affairs, but is now the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection. DOT did run one small pilot of public roadway seating, which we called street seats, um, but there were only about 25 setups mostly in Manhattan. Um, so our understanding is that uh, the relatively low participation was in large part uh, due to the cost and the process. Next slide. So as a result of COVID, um, we created the Open Restaurants Program. New York City suspended existing rules through an emergency executive order and DOT created a fast and simple way um, for restaurants to conduct their business in the public right of way. Since the launch about a year ago, over 11,000 restaurants have participated, which has helped save 100,000 jobs that could have been lost. By many accounts, this program has been a lifesaver, not just to the restaurant industry, but also the city that has seen outdoor dining um, and the incredible vitality it can bring to our sidewalks and streets as a beacon of hope and innovation in a dark time. A sign that our city can imagine a better future. Next. So of course there have been successes and challenges over the past year. We've learned both positive um, and negative lessons in this time. And those lessons are critical to informing how we proceed with a permanent program. On the positive side, we think the robust use of the emergency program was helped by three things. First, unlike the pre-emergency sidewalk program, no geographies were off limits. Any restaurant with ground floor uh, frontage and sidewalk or road space um, that met the criteria could participate. The program was free and easy uh, to access, unlike the pre-COVID sidewalk cafe program that required months of multiple reviews by multiple agencies. And third, the, roadway ele the element of roadway dining gave restaurants brand new options um, to restaurants, particularly those that might not have had enough room on the sidewalk to ac accommodate cafe seating. So for the challenges, it is also, also worth noting a few lessons learned from the emergency program. First, the speed of the rollout and the fact that the program was built from scratch under emergency circumstances created some confusion. 
As DOT learned more about operating a program like this, some of the guidance has changed. Second, throughout the program, DOT learned more about the challenges specific to the roadway seating and its interaction with the roadway. For instance, we've heard from other agencies such as FDNY that there were issues with turning radius and safety signs um, being blocked. Safety of the, is the utmost importance here and will remain so. So we continue to work with our sister agencies on that. Third, enforcement. Enforcement has been, a comp has been complicated on both sides. On one hand, you have the restaurants who are dealing with a lot and who might feel squeezed and over-inspected. On the other hand, you have some communities and particularly the mobility impaired being concerned about under enforcement. Going forward, that is something that will be addressed. Next slide, please. That being said, the program has had massive success and the mayor has charged us with developing a, a permanent successor to the emergency program, um, which requires changing a number of different laws that control outdoor dining in non-emergency situations. I'm going to talk a bit more about what we are proposing for the permanent program and then return to the topic of legal changes that we need to enact in order um, for this program to be effective. Next slide. To start with some overall elements, we anticipate that as in the emergency, DOT will administer a permanent option for both sidewalk seating and roadway um, seating with similar rules to current sidewalk cafes, but available citywide. Next slide. One final specific guidelines, um, one final specific guidelines would be very clear and will revolve around these principles that balance the use of sidewalk space by a restaurant, but maximize um, the experience of openness and activation to the general public. Notably, the size and scale of cafes would be defined by the size of the street furniture on the sidewalk, which I'll talk about next. Next slide, please. <clears throat> For most of the city, the old eight foot rule will hold, but we're exploring other options in um, special cases. For most of, uh, there will be consideration for areas that have a lot of pedestrian traffic or waivers for those that can't meet this requirement. Next. Switching gears, we think the introduction of the roadway option is a tremendous new opportunity for restaurants especially those who may have had narrow sidewalks. We are still working on how this will be set up permanently, but we will have setups in parking lanes, accept in prohibited zones, maintain public safety, um, have clear guidance uh, and enforcement on sound and comply with ADA uh, requirements. <clears throat> um, we are proposing that the new program, um, sorry, in looking both moving the legal authority to run the DOT program and in creating new processes for the roadway setups, we are looking to streamline um, the review process as much as possible while leaving in place the essential roles of agency and public review. Um, next slide, please. So to make this permanent uh, program a reality, there are three steps that are uh, needed to advance. First of which uh, is the focus of today, is the removal of locational prohibitions through zoning. It's it's the key to unlocking the full citywide universe of applicability and consolidating control and accountability for the program under a single agency. We are also working with the city council to enact legislation which will update the laws governing sidewalk cafes and then create a new set of laws and rules to govern uh, roadway cafes. Um, next slide. 
So following zoning and legal changes, we anticipate rulemaking that formalizes many of the program, many of the program, program design and application details, and then a formal op opening up of application window for a new program, which um, still will not have gone into effect. Russian communities should feel some certainty that though we are beginning a process of developing the future program, the current emergency program is expected to be in effect as is for the next year and a half at least. Um, the expectation is that restaurants will have ample time to transition to a new pro process if they choose without disruption. Um, changing zoning is the first critical step to making this pr program permanent. But as you can see on this timeline, there are multiple steps um, to developing the full program. Each step welcomes public input and review um, involved. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, we're excited to be able um, to make this program permanent. COVID-19 has really shaped the way New Yorkers think about how our streets can be used, which has been a silver lining to the pandemic. We welcome feedback and encourage all to visit our website to submit um, that to submit to us um, as we develop all, all of the elements. Um, once again, the roadway portion of this presentation is very much preliminary. And our primary purpose is presenting to the board tonight is to gather feedback um, on DCP's proposed text amendment changes specifically related to sidewalk cafes. And with that in mind, I'll turn it back to uh, DCP to talk about those changes. Thanks, Emily. Mm -hmm. As Emily mentioned, there are three main legal processes to create a permanent open restaurant program. And I'll be focusing on the text amendment uh, piece. The proposed text amendment would remove the entirety of chapter one, article four of the zoning resolution. This section regulates sidewalk cafes. Related text in parts of the zoning resolution for some special districts would also be removed. The effect of this would be fully removing zoning from dictating the location of cafes, and it would allow any restaurant to apply to DOT for a sidewalk cafe if they can meet certain criteria such as clear path and sighting criteria. Sidewalk cafes have long been a part of New York City streetscape and with them, the laws governing sidewalk cafes have evolved over the years. Up until COVID-19, zoning rules determined where these sidewalk cafes could exist. These zoning rules, uh, which are currently suspended, are defined as three different kinds of cafes and they include unenclosed sidewalk cafes, small unenclosed cafes, and enclosed sidewalk cafes. And all three have their own criteria. Most common are the unenclosed cafes, which allow for readily removable tables and chairs and fencing with no allowable overhead coverage. A small sidewalk cafe is an unenclosed cafe containing no more than one row of seating and an enclosed cafe is defined as an extension of the building into the sidewalk. Zoning has also regulated where in the city these different cafes are allowed. Here we can see the citywide regulations and I'll have a zoomed in map of CD2 in a few slides. The yellow lines show where only small cafes are allowed. The purple lines are where only unenclosed cafes are allowed and small cafes are allowed and the green lines are where all cafes are allowed. Importantly, you'll see in blue and red a lot of areas where cafes weren't allowed at all, even if the sidewalks were wide and conditions um, otherwise could have allowed uh, cafe seating. In red are areas specifically prohibited from having cafes, and blue is basically all residential areas in the city. In response to COVID-19, non-essential businesses were closed as part of the New York State pause in March 2020. This resulted in a ban on indoor dining and had a huge impact on the restaurant industry. Employment in the industry dropped 64% from the first and second quarters of 2020, and even now the indoor dining is only permitted and many restrictions haven't been lifted, and dining establishments throughout the city have gone out of business. To help support the restaurant industry and to move dining outdoors, 
New York City launched an open restaurants program allowing for emergency use of sidewalks and roadways by restaurants. Part of this program involved suspending the zoning rules that restricted sidewalk cafes in some areas. Over 11,500 uh, 11, uh, restaurants participated in the open restaurants program. 10,000 of these restaurants used the sidewalk for their outdoor dining setup. City Hall estimates that 100,000 jobs were saved in the restaurant industry that could have been lost and uh, if the city had not allowed the move outdoors. Each dot on this map represents a part a restaurant participating in the emergency program and they would otherwise not be permitted to have a sidewalk cafe according to the current zoning. The red dots are, are restaurants and locations where sidewalk cafes are specifically prohibited, such as special districts or elevated rail lines. Yellow dots are restaurants that would have been limited to small cafes only. Blue dots are residential uh, restaurants in the residential districts. Residential zoning doesn't permit restaurants, but restaurants that predate the zoning are allowed to continue operating. And we estimate that there are about 2,900 grandfathered in restaurants citywide, and a thousand of them participated in the open restaurant program. Other updates to the zoning um, and technical cleanups are also being proposed as part of the text amendment to make the text more clear and ensure that everything is cohesive with regards to the zoning resolution. This includes removing definitions and cross references to cafes, removing text that precludes operable windows that service outdoor restaurants, ensuring that no enclosure provisions require a restaurant to be fully indoors as a condition of its zoning district, and clarifying sidewalk widening text to ensure that it doesn't conflict with the operation of the open restaurants program. Um, so we can now zoom in to the CD2 context and see the current zoning regulations on sidewalk cafes. Green shows where all sidewalk cafe types have been permitted, and this primarily includes areas within the special downtown Brooklyn district. The pink lines uh, show where only unenclosed cafes are permitted, and this is largely along Fulton Mall and portions of Fourth Avenue. All cafes are prohibited in many of the areas that are zoned uh, only residential, shown here in blue, and other specific restrictions apply uh, to areas shown in red. Here we can see the sidewalk cafes that existed prior to the emergency program. There were 38 cafe licenses by the Department of Consumer and Worker Protection as of 2019. This included four enclosed cafes and 34 unenclosed cafes. And finally, these are the open restaurant program participants. We have 99 sidewalk cafes. 31 roadway cafes and 159 cafes that use both the sidewalk and the roadway space. The color dots um, show how it would be categorized in the current zoning in the map to the right. The vast majority of these, which are the pink and green dots, are places where restaurants were already permitted to participate in the existing sidewalk cafe program. The red dots are areas where cafes are prohibited due to the specific concerns that I mentioned earlier and blue are areas where they're prohibited because they are only zoned residential. The uh, proposed text amendment would allow all of these cafes the opportunity to apply in a non-emergency setting, but only if they meet the citing rules that DOT lays out. Um, that concludes my portion of the presentation and we'd be happy to take any questions. Anybody have any questions? So, so you're looking what you're looking for a must for a motion to approve the text amendments. That's correct. So uh, the primary focus of this presentation today is uh, to hear your feedback on the proposed text amendment. Um, and as I mentioned, the text amendment essentially removes a zoning's role in the um, review of these sidewalk cafes and dictating locational restrictions. Okay, I have two people who want to speak. I have Juliet. And Brian Howard. Howard. And John Du. And John Du. Okay, why, Julia, why don't you go first? Thanks, Sid. Um, I'm just wondering if the non zoning um, siting regulations will remain in place or if those will be subject to change, like eight feet from any physical obstruction, you know, distance requirements and that sort of thing. 
Um, I'll let Emily add to the answer, but yes, design guidelines are being developed uh, by DCP and other agencies, um, which will be similar to um, guidelines that exist in the current Sidewalk Cafe program, um, but I'll let Emily add to that. Emily, you're on mute. I'm sorry. Uh, what was the original question, Juliet? Sorry, I missed that. Uh, will the design guidelines for siting of the cafes um, remain the same as what they currently are, like eight feet from physical obstructions, that sort of thing, the non-zoning related uh, siting guidelines? Um, yeah, so we're still in development now, but um, that's something that we can definitely uh, keep in contact with the board about if there are changes. Okay, I just wanted to like make sure grades were still considered and ADA accessibility, which I'm sure you're considering, but yes. you know, a great grades are difficult to walk on and also should be considered. Yes, of course. All right, Brian. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, make sure I got the numbers correct. Uh, 289 um, sidewalk or roadway cafes um, now compared to 38 beforehand. The split can be a little bit confusing because some of them are on the roadway, some of them use both the sidewalk and the roadway. I can share the overall stats with you, but yes, it is a significant uh, jump in participation because the eligible geography is broader as well. Okay, thank you. I mean, I, I assumed that the the they were mutually exclusive sidewalk, roadway, and then both. Um, and so we're talking about a you know five six hundred percent increase in the number of restaurants. And if we say each of those, you know, if we're saying two hundred fifty restaurants, if each of those restaurants is able to keep on four people, it's a thousand people who were able to remain employed in our district and. I think that that's really an astounding success by the city. So thank you. Thank you. And um, to clarify, I think for the current zoning, all cafes were around uh, 207. I think the 38 number is talking about, um, oh, actually, I'll, I'll follow up with you about the specific breakdown. But yes, there is a little bit of a jump. In. Yeah, thank you. John? Okay, maybe I can play this red number. Thank you. John? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Some of the cafes have uh, electricity. How do you uh, qualify that the installation is appropriate and safe? And uh, someone in the chat put up a question about cafes blocking bike lanes. Is that uh, an issue at all in our district? Sure. Um, I can, Emily, do you want to take the question about the bike lane? Yeah, I can take the second part of the question. So um, I did read the question in the chat and um, it's not so much that the the seating portion, the structures are blocking the, the, the bike lane, but those that are doing pick up and drop off for restaurants and as, as that matter. Um, that's something that is under the jurisdiction of NYPD since they are the ones that enforce um, that. But uh, that's something also I can bring up to our bike unit to see if there's anything that we can do um, that's preventative. And uh, regarding the roadway structures, um, again, the design criteria is being developed, but there are a lot of lessons being learned based on the emergency program, and there may be restrictions in place that cover certain conditions such as heating, electricity, seasonality, and things of that nature. Um, so we can certainly follow up with you when it's more refined, but these are aspects that um, all of the, the interagency working group um, is taking into consideration in developing the new rules. I have, a, I have a question. Can I speak, Sandy Balboza? Sure, Sandy, but if I can just, I just got a second in here. Said so there's a list of persons who would like to speak. And of course, our Sandy is one and she's on deck right now. But after that, we also have Patrick Kalaki. 
Ernie Augustus from the committee and a few members of the public as well, but after the committee members will listen. Okay, you uh, you want to call them off? Uh, I don't see them on my uh, my chat. So will you please call them off for me? Sure. If we let Sandy and Patrick go, uh, Sandy, Patrick, and Ernie from the committee, and we'll put the uh, members of the public in the chat for you to see. Thank you. Go ahead, Sandy. Okay. Um, well, I wanted to know. Uh, right now, there's no fee for a restaurant to set up, they, they just have to, what, have, send in an application? That's correct. Right now it's a self-certification process and I believe that there is no fee, uh, but the future program, um, Emily, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, would consider um, something along the lines of irrevocable consent, which is the mechanism to allow um, the use of city streets and sidewalks. So there may be fees associated with it. Um, the details have not been developed yet, um, but yes, that's something that would be considered as part of the permanent program. Okay, and can I ask one more question? Um, so in some of the photographs, it showed restaurants using both the sidewalk and the street. Um, and it looked like there was room to get through, but um, I don't know, you know, so are you, are you going to enforce, well, so they're allowed to do both sidewalk and street, and then they have to have a certain amount of space for people to, you know, walk through. What, what is that space? I think actually maybe somebody asked that a little while ago. So uh, the photographs in the images uh, reflect the emergency program conditions that may or may not comply with the new rules that are being created. But um, the current sidewalk cafe program has a clear path requirement of eight feet or 12 feet, depending on uh, the level of foot traffic. And those types of rules or similar rules would may continue to apply. And that's something that's being uh, developed still, but uh, typically it's an eight foot clear path based on the existing rules. Okay. Lucy, protein? No. Hang on. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I wanted to comment. It's been a bit of a wild west out there. There's no restrictions, there's no size or style restrictions. Restaurants just seem to build these structures, take as many parking spaces or street spaces as they want to, whether they're filled up or not. And, you know, there's a big difference between a sidewalk ca cafe and a street cafe. And these cafes do damage to the other shops around. It makes it difficult for deliveries. It makes it difficult for customers to park and pick up goods. Um, it hurts. It hurts. Uh, you know, so it hurts other businesses, and the restaurants are giving the preference. Uh, you know, it hurts the local residents. There's been inundations of rats and dirt and noise that goes on till two in the morning. I'm sure you saw how in the Lower East Side there was a rebellion at the community board. It's practically fistfights because the residents are so upset because there was nonstop noise and filth all night, late into the early hours of the morning. Um, you know, it has made parking for residents that much harder, which increases traffic and stress, pollution for those who live in an area where they had parking and now the restaurants have taken up a lot of the parking. So, you know, I don't understand why this needs to be a permanent fixture of the city. What about other businesses? Can now the pharmacy or the hardware store say, oh, well, we want space in the street too. What is, why does, yeah. there's no restrictions. So I, I think it needs to be thought through a lot more carefully than just say, we're gonna make this permanent. Um, you know, there's a lot of problems and rats is a big one and, Rats create a health issue, not to mention the noise, which also creates a health issue. So don't just carte blanche this thing, say, oh, you know, great. One thing during the pandemic, but to make this permanent creates a lot of headache for the people who actually live here and pay their taxes. Thank you. Mark Walters. Excuse me, said we're forgetting our committee members. 
Patrick and Ernie, I want to say something too. Um, I don't know if you've said my name. I, I just put a comment in the chat. Uh, it's contrary to what Lucy just said. I, I think it's been an amazing program, an incredible response to such a difficult thing. I, I just want to congratulate DOT and I have full confidence. I, obviously, there's a lot to improve, you know, and get get right and get make better from all the learnings. But uh, I have full confidence that DOT will do that. Thank you so much. This is Mark Wouters. Hello. Excuse me, Mark. Can you hold hold on, please? We'll call your name, Ernie. Ernie Augustus, committee member. Mr. Augustus, you're muted. Ernie, you have to come off mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. So now I was, uh, this is my, my comments is directed to the members of the transportation committee and to the full community board. This is something that the, that the committee have to take its time and to digest and to understand. You know, we can understand, I can understand a temporary uh, restaurant program, but this move to make it permanent, you know, it violates uh, the whole city ULIP process. You know, uh, there's a process that uh, inquires that that uh, that requires the input of the full community uh, via the community board. Uh, you have the um, you have the community board. You have the borough president. You have city planning. And this whole thing sort of short, uh, short circuit that. Uh, a lot of the amendment that the representatives from DOT are talking about is in the province of the city council. You know, the uh, council legislate and the agencies promulgate, uh, promulgate regulations. They don't, they're not supposed to make legislation. Uh, they are putting up this thing about the amendments. All these amendments would require the city council to act. Are you going to change the city zoning, zoning tax, the landmarks law, the city human rights law, uh, the provision for public access? Uh, I could go on and on. Uh, this, this is a pro the city council cannot abrogate its responsibility as a legislative body. DLT has no idea about uh, you know, legislating. That's not, the, that's not their prerogative. Uh, there's, there's some impact, and you know, there's building codes, uh, marriage codes, uh, liability issues. Uh, but basically, this whole emphasis is to circumvent the community board uh, and to set up what um, uh, uh, the former speaker wanted was a czar or a dictator to dictate zoning laws and a rule for the city of New York. Like, screw the community board. You know, this is, uh, you know, this has impact uh, and, you know, whether it's fire or building traffic uh, and what and and what DOT is attempting to do. And I know that the representatives from DOT aren't responsible uh, for the, you know, for the legislation, but uh, it's a thing that we as a committee and as a community board have to sit down and carefully examine, uh, you know, so that's my point. Um, if I can just make one quick clarification, um, the item before you today about the text amendment um, is just to remove the location restrictions about sidewalk cafes. The rest of the legislation process is at the beginning stages and there will be more information and more opportunities to seek input. This is our first round of outreach efforts. Um, and the other part that I would note is um, sidewalk of phase the future permits are expected to continue to be reviewed by community boards as the current process um, that exists. So I just wanted to uh, put that out there. Hello, this is Latrell. Um, I have a question. Is this um, presentation is going to go before the HESA committee? So they make a lot of decisions for us about health and also about restaurants. Sorry, uh, can you repeat that, please? Um, 
Um, one question? of the community, community boards committee is a HESA com committee, and they deal with the health and restaurants. And usually before restaurants are open, they come to the HESA committee and they um, present. And they, they talk about health and also about restaurants being accessibility, outdoor seating, et cetera. So, uh, we've shared a copy of the presentation with the board and we're happy to speak to other committees as needed, um, but this uh, being a land use item affecting the streets and transportation, uh, we offered the presentation to the land use and transportation committees first, but we're happy to come back and share more information with others as needed. Bill Stein, Fulton Ferry Landing Association. Thank you. Um, Lucy stole my line or used my line that, um, about it being a wild west out there with the, with the um, street sheds. And um, so I, and I was the one that asked the question in the chat about the bicycle lanes and that's been answered. But um, we also have a pedestrian plaza that DOT built here 10 years ago. And um, when there are events in the park, we've got hordes of pedestrians that come down Old Fulton Street to the park. And presently, the pedestrian plaza has been taken over by all of these sheds. One restaurant has sidewalk seating and sheds in the, in the pedestrian plaza, leaving basically only room for a single line of pedestrians to, to, to walk down the block on that side. So I want that to be looked at, that pedestrian plazas were built expressly for pedestrians. They were, they were when it was initially built, the Dumbo bid had maybe four or five tables um, with umbrellas, you know, for people to sit at, but there was no serve, no restaurant service. It was just for people to sit and who had purchased food. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing is that we also are talking about Wild West. We have a new retail establishment on Old Fulton Street that has 12 tables and 20 some odd seats in a bus on the sidewalk in a bus stop. And I just want to um, I want to ask whether the regulation for no sidewalk seating in a bus stop, which is currently law with the DCA, whether that's going to be maintained. Thank you. Hello, Sandy Rayburn. City DLT. Hello, yeah, I just want to ask that question. If there's an open restaurant set up in a bus stop, that's not allowed. So when we have that information, we'll send inspectors out there and check them. That's not allowed. Thanks, Keith. And, and if I might add um, to what Keith just said, if you see such flagrant violations, please um, please call 311 and report them. Thank you. Ms. Rayburn, you're muted. While we wait on her, can we go to Tori Robinson? It's, yeah. Hi, this is Tori. Um, this is actually not necessarily strictly about the sidewalk restaurant program, which I actually am a huge proponent of. I think that as particularly in Dumbo in general with the exception possibly of Old Fulton, they've done a really nice job, but our streets are quite wide and allow for, for that kind of thing for most of the restaurants. What I did want to bring up is the continued closure of Washington Street between water and front to allow for the, um, the tables that I believe are put out by Dumbo bid. Um, I think that there are so many places for restaurants to have tables. And in fact, most of the restaurants, if not all in, in sort of central Dumbo area have their own sidewalk seating area. And certainly the park is a block away and continuing to close that, that block as part of the open streets makes the situation in Dumbo, which is total chaos, completely untenable. And it's virtually impossible to navigate the neighborhood as a resident, particularly if you need to use a car, God forbid, to bring in groceries or run errands or anything like that. It's, it's, it's almost impossible to navigate. I think it creates an incredibly dangerous safety situation because huge delivery trucks park up parallel at each end of that block. It makes it really hard for kids who are crossing the street there. And I, I don't know when time to talk about this is, but I just wanted to bring that up as part of the discussion.
Um, that's something, uh, the Washington um, Street closure, we are working um, with the Dumbo bid um, on that uh, closure. If that's something that you want to speak more about offline, uh, best way to do so is to connect with them and uh, myself and we can get a conversation started. Thank you. I've sent a note to Dumbo bid and so I'll contact them and then hopefully contact you through them. Ms. Rayburn, are you with yes. us? I'm available if you can hear me, yes? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to say that uh, I really believe that this is a the public-private uh, partnership run amok. Um, the, uh, this is basically an undemocratic emergency powers uh, effort being abused uh, that, of course, was necessary during the COVID situation. Uh, but taking away public property, our property, uh, and taking away the rights of residents and their quality of life and the implied warrant of habitability and the right to a livable place is being usurped for profit entities. So let me just say that. Now, one of the things that I want to address uh, is this business of the NYPD is going to mitigate the noise issues. Understand that the NYPD issues permits for amplified uh, uh, machinery, but there is no designation for decibel maximum levels. The DEP does not weigh in on outdoor uh, 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 situations like noisy pedestrian plazas. There is no mitigation to this, and nor should there be by the NYPD because they're busy saving our rear ends with crime. So this is something that is a kind of bait and switch to say that uh, noise will be somehow mitigated by the NYPD or under some kind of control flies in the face of the reality that we in Fort Greene, in and around Fowler Plaza, have been living with even before the open restaurants, which are now adding insult to injury. So that's a reality check, and uh, I think it's important to note that. I want to also uh, rubber stamp what Lucy has said about rats, um, which uh, are running amok. I also want to reiterate what uh, John Dew noted in terms of electrical hookups, which uh, the DOB evidently allows restaurants to do to their street sheds, but would certainly uh, issue some kind of uh, a warrant or problem uh, for anybody else who would do it. Um, certainly, uh, Thank the you, Sandy. Yep. You're over time. Okay, I've, I think I've had my say. Thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. Mr. Morrow, are you with us? Richard Morrow? Mr. Morrow, you're still on mute. Okay, we'll come back to him. Mark Wooters and then board member Juliet Cullen Chung. Yes, hello. Uh, this is Mark Wooters. Um, uh, I oh. run Mark Wooters Studios, and we actually proposed some of the first drawings for the outdoor dining restaurant program. We turned them in for free um, to Department of City Planning back in April of 2020, when everything was shut down. We were trying to save people's jobs. We proposed a number of other COVID street issues. Um, I really applaud the city for making it during an emergency, a citywide program. But we always wondered, we, I guess I always imagined that somehow the neighborhoods would have different abilities to accommodate outdoor restaurants in the long run. And so it's, I, it's great to see that people, these, these businesses have been able to get back on their feet. Um, and I'm sure a lot of them aren't back on their feet. Um, a lot of important jobs. Um, but I do wonder about now that we, about making them permanent without having some sort of local way of looking at 
idiosyncratic locations um, that could be problematic long term. And I, and I, I don't know that I want to do a blanket zoning that just allows it uh, by right. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, who's uh, uh, Juliet? I think and Juliet. Anyone else? Go ahead, Juliet. Thanks. I, just quickly, um, the the license agreement or revocable, revocable consent. I was wondering of what duration um, you guys were thinking of, because I feel like that could be a compromise solution to, um, you know, some of the um, community members' objections to there being, um, you know, a lack of community input in the process. Although I personally feel like a streamlining of the process to allow um, the cafes to be able to open without hiring an attorney and doing a, an architecture plan and lots of paperwork, as long as they follow the rules, as long as they comply with zoning, I feel like the efficiency is good for the city, good for our public space. But I also understand the concerns. So if there could be a limited duration that before renewal of whatever agreement the um, establishment has, the city could check the 311 records to see if there's any complaint, complaints or that sort of thing to see if the um, cafe has been in compliance with all of the regulations before it gets renewed, that might be a, a good uh, solution. You know, my understanding of the vocal sense, it's a four year cycle. It's a four year and it's got to come back for renewal. And and my so also my understanding is that these would uh, very much like the alcohol program, they would go through the communities for their comment before DOT issues a final license. I don't think it's a, uh, you know, it's, you know, it is a, uh, they would change the text amendment to allow them. But my understanding was that the, uh, it would go through some, you know, foreshortened, not the one year, uh, in order to get a uh, uh, a license for a uh, uh, the cafes that they have now. But there would be some requirement, and you know, the limitations would be part of what's baked into this. And this is just a text amendment to allow that process to go forward. Am I wrong on that, Emily, or uh, or uh, or Aritha? Um, Emily or Keith, please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the duration or the actual mechanism, I don't believe we have the details yet. This feedback is really helpful for us to take into consideration, but I don't think we have that information yet. The details are not there yet. We're still waiting to develop them. We're going to go back to, I know a lot of multiple comments about community board input, and we're not going to get that. No, we are going to get community board input so once we get those details and we will be coming out to boards. But that has not been determined. So, so you know, it, it's a little difficult. Sid, can I... you... Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I would That's just little... add that because the investment is limited, I I think a four year duration is way too long to recoup an investment of like you know some plywood to put out on the street to make a a, a little platform or enclosure for outdoor cafe. One year should be a uh, a reasonable term. Yeah, but I don't, I don't think necessarily you want them coming back to the community board every year either. I mean, they, you know, that you could there. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't include the community board in it. I would just have DOT do the review. If there's no complaints, you know, they can renew. Yeah, but they're going to have to go back to the community and ask them if there are any complaints. And then, in any in any case, I, I think that uh, uh, it may be premature to ask for a uh, a motion on this. Without having some of the more of the those those nuances filled out, I don't know if there's anybody. Is there anybody else? Yeah, there's two hands up. I see Richard Morrow. Yeah, listen, and, we have sure. to get the business people who are out there who have to pay the bills, who have to pay their rent, who have to pay their employees to come in on this discussion. We are talking in in ethereal land. We're out. We're out. Listen, you go to these people if they're not there. When you want a, a container of milk, if they're not there, if you want, a, a, you know, a, a, an organic a, a fruit juice, or if you're not there, if you want a cheapy one, you know, from some unknown thing, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go? These are the people. Listen, we have to protect our our infrastructure. We have to protect the people that supply us with our our needs. We have to protect them. The people that Thank supply you. us with our, 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 our dinners and our things, that's what Thank makes our, our community grow. If we Thank let you, them go, Esther, it's a problem. Thank you, Esther. Uh, 
I just think that, um, like you said, Sid, to vote on this without, you don't have enough information. And another thing now, this is going to be fee based. So do we know that these restaurants and um, will want to pay this fee without even having the information about the fee? I mean, we don't even know if they want to comply to this. They are just now getting back on their feet. And now you're talking about a fee. We don't know how structures should be built. We have no information. And our streets are going to, I mean, to do it permanent, it's ridiculous. I, 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 I know I'm not part of the transformation, transportation committee, but I don't think you have enough information to vote on this. Is there anybody else before I ask the committee if they would like to propose a, a motion? Does anybody in the committee like to propose a motion? I would like to propose a motion to um, support this where it stands, understanding that they're going to be coming back to us with more details um, as they develop them. Is there a second? I'm going to ask one more time. Uh, Is Brian, I'll second that. Okay, there's a motion on the floor to support the text amendment as proposed by DOT and DCP. Any discussion? Um, did, did Andy Balbos. So, um, you know, I'm on Atlantic Avenue and in Warham Hill, we have, um, you know, the street dining and it doesn't seem to be a problem here. But I think we're all aware that in certain places it, it is a problem. And so um, to make this permanent without some of the concerns, I, I think very realistic concerns, uh, you know, when the city does something, you know, is it political? Is it, you know, really thought out? Um, I, I just think there's not enough here, even though, I mean, I have something, uh, absolute coffee a few doors down. It's no problem. So we had a meeting there the other day. Um, it, you know, it's quiet, but I think there's not enough, uh, there's not enough in this to, to make me want to vote for it. And I do agree with Richard um, about the need for the merchants the restaurants to stay in business, um, we wouldn't have a city without them. But I just don't trust this this whole, you know, this thing to vote on it right now. Okay, thank you, Sandy. Uh, John, John first. Yeah. I sort of had the same view that we shouldn't be voting on it yet. I do realize based on what Amrita said that we talked about a lot of things, but the only thing that she's talked about and the only thing we'll be voting on would be a text amendment dealing solely with sidewalk cafes. It wouldn't have anything to do with roadway impediments, but we've, our committee's always had, we've always dealt with sidewalk cafes already within the context of what uh, uh, consumer affairs and uh, worker protection uh, was limited to, but suddenly opening that up, it, it, it can easily change the dynamics because it's not, it, it would go forward for any street space. Right now, if, you're, if, if there's a pharmacy or a clothing store or something else, there, that, that space is now going to be more valuable because it's only a restaurant that could come in there and could expand to the street and maybe expand to the roadway. So I think it requires a little more consideration, uh, you know, um, restaurants weren't the only retail establishment that were destroyed by the pandemic. And, you know, we're, we're, somebody's mentioned giving up all of the street space. And yes, we can charge a fee for revocable consent, but a restaurant that may have been takeout only or a hole in the wall, who now can get sidewalk space and roadway space for maybe nothing or for maybe a small amount, 
is become that space becomes more valuable because they've got you know it's like buying a a co-op or buying a condo with a terrace they suddenly have more it's it's extra space that they're getting so i think i, I would hold off uh, having there being a motion i would vote no on the motion well i is that a motion to take is that a motion to table Mr. Uh, uh, our parliamentarian. No, no, um, um, you know, we we we're they're they're asking for go ahead. Uh, uh, DCP is asking for us, if I reflect it correctly in the minutes, um, that they they want us to. Uh, 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 they just they want our opinion. Okay. I think they've heard our opinion. I don't know how much they want to vote. And it's also, and also, we don't vote. We don't normally vote on zoning zoning resolution text changes. That's really land use, and I know they they're going to land use. That's a, yeah. That that was my next point. I agree with John, but this is a land use uh, issue, and it should come before the land use committee because you're changing the use of public space. You know, uh, you don't get any around it. This is what this is all about, you know, and how you go through the process of changing the use of public space should be reviewed by the language committee and the broader community. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, excuse me, can I, can I tuck in here for a second? Sure. So this, so yes, land use usually um, reviews items dealing with land use or LPC items. However, in instances where um, the action itself impacts more heavily on the other side, um, the alternate committee reviews it. In this instance, it's the transportation committee. For instance, um, there was recently an action from the parks department for Fort Green Park. It's a landmark park. However, it was reviewed by the parks committee because the, the action itself affected parks. And so this is the committee that deals with the use of our roadways and our sidewalks. Therefore, this action is now before the transportation committee. Might uh, I add uh, Colin, that, Colin. one second, let me complete. Uh, Might I add, and then I'm off the mic, that this is um, a non euler text amendment. There are 13 days left for the community board review. So whatever way, the motion goes, if we do not make a motion and vote, then we have given up our opportunity. Well, let, let me comment. say something. Well, but, but, wait, wait, wait. Hold on, hold on. Let me, let me, is this, but this is a citywide resolution, right? It's yes. not just for CB2, right? Yes, it's citywide. Yeah, but I, I'm gonna take a, I'm gonna take a, a, this was put on our agenda by the board office. So I'm gonna take the position that the board office knows what it's doing when it puts something on our agenda. So at this point, the, the, we have a motion properly seconded. So I'm gonna call the question and, and I'm gonna ask, uh, uh, I'm gonna ask John to do a roll call. Sure. All right, wait, uh, we're having a discussion. I think like a handful of people have spoken, aren't there? The rest of us who would like to also weigh in before we go. You haven't put up your hand. I mean, uh, you know, uh, I, I was calling based on whose hands was up, all right? Uh, that's or or in the uh, or in the uh, uh, chat. So that's how I look to see who wants it. If you, you have brought, if you want to say something, please feel feel free. Yes, and then I'm gonna you, then I'm gonna call the question. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, so I think there's really three points here that we're being asked to consider. One is replacing the zoning restrictions uh, with this text amendment. Uh, two, I mean, the, the program will now be managed solely by DOT um, and that the design requirements will be consolidated and streamlined uh, as well as, you know, uh, requirements added about uh, clear paths and pedestrian right of way uh, and accessibility. And then the third one, I believe, is, you know, citing rules, uh, fees and such. Um, it's just, it seems like we're being asked to say whether or not we think you know, 
sidewalk cafes are good or bad, or they should be more or less. And really the question before us is, should we consolidate this in DOT um, and have a, a single agency review it? Uh, if okay. All right, I'm calling the question. Uh, hold, no, no, that's it. I'm calling Mr. the question. Mr. Meyer, excuse me. I've heard, this is John Duke. I've heard no discussion of question agreements with now. the landlords, and there's no discussion of the liability aspect. Of John, I'm calling the question. I vote no. So, wait, John, John Quinn's going to call the uh, roll. All right, Mr. Augustus. Uh, no. Ms. Balboza. You have to unmute can you, Sandy. Can you oh, hear me? your fingers? Now we can Sandy, hear you. What, what's your vote, Sandy? My vote is no. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. My vote is no because it's just too unresolved. Juliet Cullen, Miss Juliet, Miss Cullen. Yes. Mr. Yes. Dew. I repeat, pre. No landlord, no liability, no. no, no, no. Three no's. Uh, Ms. Gallo. Doreen, are you still there? She's still here? Ms. Gallo is here. Ms. Gallo, you're muted. Board members, if you haven't voted, please find your unmute, unmute button. Doreen. I'll come back to her. Brian Powell? Yes. Patrick Kalaki? Yes. Mr. Scala? Oh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, not zero yet. Mr. Meyer? I'm, I'm, I'm going to pass until the end. <laughs> I'm voting no. Uh, Mr. Scala? Mr. Scala sent a message that he stepped away about 30 minutes ago. So if Ms. Gallo is on the line, she and Mr. Meyer, those are the last two. Ms. Gallo, Doreen, you still there? Yes, I am. Sorry. Your vote? Um, I'm going to abstain. Thanks. Mr. Meyer. I'm going to abstain too. It's defeated. Three yes, four no, two abstentions, which count as a no vote. So it would have. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. The excuse next me, one John. Excuse me, John. Do we need another vote in the positive? On the yes, we do. No, we have a vote. We, 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 the vote was not to support the changes. So, yeah, you know, that's the end of it. No, you the motion to... was to support with follow up. Yeah, so from we voted, voted no. No, that's it. You don't know. You don't have to take, you don't yes. have to take, you don't have to take a vote. vote in that, that, that we've, the, 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 there was one motion. It was defeated. Next topic. Right. Next topic the Sand Street bike lane update, Department of Transportation. Keith, are you going to be speaking to that or? Go ahead, Emily, whenever you're ready. Yeah, um, I think Keith is just going to be speaking on it, um, but. Oh, Commissioner Bray? Yeah. Is Preston on as well? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Keith, are you here? He may have it, stepped on. It, it, sh it she shows us still there. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that, I'm yeah. back. Yeah. What's the question again? We're doing this. <laughs> 
this, this is the Bad Street Bike Lane update. Yeah. yeah. So, so we were just I mean, uh, giving an update. Sorry, go ahead, Keith. No, no, go ahead, Emily. No, floor is yours. I was about to say, yeah. So we sent a letter and form of the board, and we also made a round of calls to people uh, a couple weeks ago that we we're going to move forward with the construction of the bike lane on Navy Street. Uh, we informed people, we gave the reason why in the letter. Obviously, we had several meetings with the community. Uh, well, we had one meeting with the community, and obviously, a couple of presentations with CB2 about it. And despite the community not being in support of the program, and obviously, community board two also not being in support of the program, we explained in that letter of why we felt that we want to move forward despite the disapproval there. And so, we are going to begin implementing the project soon. In fact, we're going to take some steps to implement on Navy Street now. That's pretty much the update I have. I don't know if Preston or Emily does anything more you want to add. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the bus stops are uh, likely to be relocated uh, this week. Um, we are, um, the other implementation uh, is, we'll, we'll follow at a later date. Latrell, are you still here? Yes, I'm here. You want to say something? Yeah, um, you saw Nashalant just like came on and just like disregard this. I feel I feel the Ferry community was is disrespected all over again. You met with us, we asked to meet again. Um, I even the 84th precinct asked we invited you to a meeting with us, from my understanding, and you couldn't show up to that. The fabric community is continuing to be overlooked. And I really, I'm really trying to figure out why we're overlooked. I have my views, but those are my views, and I'm not gonna, you know, those are my views, but why are we continue overlooked? We want protected bike lanes. We want the bikers to be protected. We want them to be protected and traveling so nothing can happen to them. We also are losing 14 plus parking spaces that we serve the Navy Yard community, the NYPD, um, the fire department, the two schools, the, the surrounding communities. We have lack of parking spaces. And also it's this is a traffic problem. You walk through with other communities and did a walk through at, during the, um, the Brooklyn Bridge, after the Brooklyn Bridge for the bike lane. Nobody thought about coming to look at the Farragut community and the traffic problem that we was having with the, you know, with, with everything that was going on, where there was so much traffic on Navy and Sands and Navy and, um, and Golden Sand. It was so much traffic. And it was no, it was no communication to reach out to us. We wrote a letter about it. You did not comment about that in the letter. Um, members of the community was almost hurt crossing the street. It became, it became dangerous for people. And I'm, I'm just like speechless that you're so nonchalant about we're losing parking spaces in our community. And you're not even putting a protected bike lane for the bikers to be protected. And the street is wide enough. The street is wide enough for, for a bike lane to be protective and also for the cars to be still there. In other communities in Manhattan, they have the same as I protect bike lanes for in the parking spaces and on the Upper East Side. Why Farragut cannot have the same thing? Why? You know, the community board supported us recently in the last two votes. So you're not even listening to the community board. So you're, not Sarah, you're not even listening to the, what can I say one thing? You received over 300 plus letters from the community in reference to this. 
from people who not who who deal who's in the community every day who live in the community and you disregard that Thank you. So, uh, as I stated, uh, we, 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 I'm sorry, did Mr. Augustus want to speak up? Yeah, uh, there's also Cheryl, uh, there's also Cheryl Goodman too who wants to speak, but Ernie, if you want to speak, go ahead. Yeah, first of all, I didn't understand Mr. Johnson's presentation. I heard him say that, uh, that two uh, bus stops are being moved and that was it for this evening and that you're going to report back on the next item. Did I misunderstand you, Mr. Johnson? Um, so as we uh, talked about in our previous presentation, um, the, sorry, can you hear that? I just want um, to understand what you said, that's all. Sorry, I was hearing feedback. Um, yeah. So, um, so in our previous presentation, we talked about how it was necessary to relocate the uh, bus stop on the northbound bus stop on the east side of Navy Street. And uh, I mean, I'm just, uh, I was just saying earlier that that work is expected to begin uh, either this week or ne maybe next week. Okay, I think um, the, next, the next thing I wanted to know was was there any response from you? I didn't hear it regarding the bike lane. I'm very concerned about that. Um, I'm sorry, what do you mean a response? I didn't, do you address the bike lane? Uh, uh, so what I, what I was saying earlier is that uh, the, the bike lane work uh, is expected to follow that. Um, there are some uh, other permits on the street dealing with like. Uh, okay, uh, yeah. uh, you're speaking cryptically. The bike lane work is to follow what? No bike lane or have a bike lane or parking or no. Uh, there's going to be, uh, uh, Ernie. There's going to be a two lane, a two lane bike lane north and southbound on the east side of the street, and a southbound light, a bike lane on the west side of the street. Right? Isn't that correct, uh, uh, Keith? Yeah. Yes, that's sir. that's what was approved. All right. So they're taking and, away the parking. And they're taking away. They're taking, they're taking away parking. Away 14 yes, parking spaces on the on the east side of the street. All right. Maybe I'm a little hypersensitive. I just read an article this morning in the, in the Washington Post about another highway going through a in, in North North Charleston, and I'm all because of no, there is no consideration of an impact on a black neighborhood, on a black housing. You know, I, it, it just blows my mind. It really does. It's all, it's all about impact. You know, these people are dependent upon the automobile. Why? Because they live in a segregated community. Whether it's uh, Red Hook or Queensboro or Far Rockaway, they had cars out of necessity. That's why, and that shouldn't be negatively impacted. You know, it, it should not be for a bike. You can bike by a you know, parked car. It sounds like a false dichotomy that I heard on Clinton Avenue when it was dangerous or allegedly or alleged dangerous. And yeah, guess what? They're biking on Clinton Avenue with parked cars. Ask John Do, who lives on Clinton. Mr. Augustus, uh, Mr. Augustus, we're having trouble hearing you clearly because of some microphone issues. Okay. You know, because again, you can you can bike by park cars. Go in Clinton Avenue in Clinton Hill and you'll see it. Observe it. All right. Cheryl, you wanted to say something? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I'll okay. Can too. Okay, so uh, again, my name is Cheryl Goodman. I'm a resident of Farragut Houses. I live on Sand Street on the corner of Sands and Navy, which I'm very, very familiar with because I've lived here. Um, I have a letter that was written by you, Mr. Bray, on the 7th of September, stating that after review, we found that Navy Street is not wide enough 
to provide both bicycle safety improvements and parking on both sides of the street. Okay. And so with that, prior to the uh, Navy Yard being reconfigured on the, on the Navy Yard side of the street, that sidewalk was enlarged, okay? Navy Street used to be a four lane street, two going south, two going north. It was wide enough. So possibly narrow that sidewalk, put your bike lane there, leave our parking as it is. That is a solution because you say it's not wide enough. The street was definitely wide enough, but due to reconstruction, you took the width away. That's number one. Number two, with the advent of the bike lane on the Brooklyn Bridge, we have an undue amount of traffic flowing from Navy to Sands to the bridge. It's backlog, it's jammed. We don't have traffic guards or anything. That's gonna pose more of a problem, more of a danger to your bike riders that you so greatly want to protect. Do they need protection? Yes, they do. At the cost of the safety to the community, you really, really did not consider the residents of Farragut, either with the bike lane going onto the bridge, with the bike lane going up Sand Street, because Sand Street used to have two lanes on either side and parking. We're now reduced to one lane. And now you want to do it on Navy Street to narrow it even more, take away parking, and it's more than 14 spaces because you're taking away the spaces on Navy and you're taking away the spaces that the buses are now gonna have to occupy once you change that. And then not only that, on Gold Street between Sands and Nassau, you've taken half the block <laughs> to create a turning lane onto Nassau Street, which was totally unnecessary. So I'm concerned that the DOT doesn't care about the Farragut community. It doesn't care about the Concord Village community. And you're definitely not taking into consideration the community on 7th and 8th Avenue, which is now up in protest because of travel, travel traffic patterns that you now want to change. Who is this benefiting? Everybody does not ride a bike. Cheryl, Cheryl, everybody does not Cheryl, ride a bike. Cheryl, so everybody Cheryl, should not have to Cheryl, be prepared come, because Cheryl, of bike come, riders. Cheryl, please come to a conclusion. I'm going to come to a conclusion. I think one, you should not move forward. If you are narrow the sidewalk on the Navy Yard side of the street, put the bike lane over there. You can have the parking where it is. They'll have enough space just like you have in your presentation in Manhattan or um, Central Patrick Park, okay? There is enough room. Now, either you Cheryl, don't care Cheryl, about the neighborhood Cheryl, or you're just too lazy to put Cheryl, in a good Cheryl, attempt to make it good. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Anybody else? Look, uh, Keith, you know my uh, opinion. I believe- yes, I want to say something to say. You know, i never seen, I mean, does this happen? The community board voted this down and now DOT comes here tonight and say, oh no, it's gonna go ahead just like that. I mean, is transportation alternatives running the DOT? I mean, do the nobody care about what the black communities have to say? This is outrageous. Esther? We voted it down and you come in here to just say, oh, we doing it. Esther? It don't make no sense. We gotta Esther? get a lawyer, we gotta get a lawyer. You may need to get a lawyer, but the, our opinion, unfortunately, is just advisory. Keith knows my opinion, all right? He's heard it before, all right? I, I really do think, I mean, you've heard what I said to you when you presented this. I am for bike lanes. I think that bike lanes save people's lives. I'm for protected bike lanes. I think protected bike lanes are better than unprotected bike lanes. I believe, you know, I drove, I, I, I after I came back from Staten Island today, I drove down 4th Avenue. 4th Avenue now has a protected bike lane behind uh, the uh, uh, parked cars. 
and I swear those those parking lanes are no more those lanes are no more than ten feet wide. Right? Uh, I, again, I, I you know you've heard the people say it. There are people on the board here that are in favor of those bike lanes. They haven't spoken, but they are in favor of the bike lanes. But I again ask you to go back and look and see if you can accommodate both the bike <coughs> lanes, both the two lane bike two way bike lane, and the parking. Anybody else? Can I say one thing? Can I say one thing? A few weeks ago at the BQE meeting, it was interesting, and I was kind of shocked. Um, you spoke about all the communities, who, whoever it was, somebody doing a presentation. I don't remember his name, but he never spoke about Farragut, but he spoke about the Navy Yard. So it was still right there in the DOT meeting. I was I was just like amazed how y'all spoke about the surrounding communities, the Navy Yard. And I didn't even think about Farragut. So what is that saying? Is that, is that saying that's your view of Farragut? Like you're, you're really dismissing us. You're speaking about everybody around Farragut, but you're not speaking about Farragut. And it's, it's the same thing that's going on right now. If it was another community, will you come into the community after you know, the letters, the community board, everybody, would you still do the same thing? Like my, like Miss Esther said, uh, everybody said, Ernest said, would you, Cheryl said, would you still do the same thing in other communities if it wasn't Farragut community? Deborah, Deborah Macbeth, you're gonna get the last word on this. No, John Dew's gonna get the last word. Deborah, go ahead. You have to, you have to, you have to unmute yourself, Deborah. You have to, there you go. I'm now. sorry, I see. Okay, I want to know. Yeah, you're muted again, Deborah. Deborah, you're muted. Ms. McGrath, we had to mute you. There's terrible feedback on your line. Okay. Which, Which bus are you moving? Ms. McBeth, if there's, there's three another, bus stops there. If there's someone else in the room with you that's also on the meeting, one of you needs to turn your volume off. Okay, I'm sorry. Hello, oh, can you okay. hear me now? Yeah, thank you yes. so much. Yes. Okay, I would like to know, what are you doing with the bus stops? There are three bus stops there. Which buses are you moving and where are you moving them to? Because you're saying 14 um, parking spaces and I know it's more than 14. So which bus are you moving and where are they going? Um, yeah, just a moment. Um, um, yes, yeah, so uh, the bus stop on the uh, southeast uh, corner of Navy and Sands, um, that bus stop will be relocated because that's where the, the bike lane is going to go. And so the, uh, the B69 and the B57 go down Sand Street, so there'll be one bus stop located on Sand Street while the B62 continues up Navy Street and there'll be a bus stop located on the Northeast side of Navy Street. That's because you don't understand the gridlock at Navy and Sands on, thir on Thursdays and Fridays. I've seen traffic <coughs> ride, like if there's a delivery or a truck there on Sands where you plan on moving that bus stop, the cars will ride up on the um, bike lane to get around the bus because it causes congestion at Navy Street and Sands. So you move in the bus lane there, how many parking spaces are we, by the way, how many parking spaces are we losing at that stop? I think it, it'll be probably like three spaces. I think it's roughly right, John, John, you want to talk? Go ahead. Yes. Um, community Board 2 was one of the first community boards that had to entertain bike lanes because of the bridges. We had an agreement with DOT that they could install bike lanes as long as there is no removal of parking to accommodate the bike lane. We have this throughout Community Board 2, go down any block. The cars remain, the bike lanes are adjacent to parked 
cause. That has been the policy in Community District 2 for the 20 years that we have had bike lanes. Go to all the streets. We did not remove any cars parking. The bike lanes are there. We can do the same thing on Navy Street and Sand Street, as is the case throughout the rest of the district. I'm done. All right. There, there's no, there's uh, no vote needed on this one. I must tell you that, uh, uh, and, and Keith heard it before. I, I do believe, and we voted last time for a situation that would accommodate the bike lanes and the parking. And I know that 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 was rejected, but I'm going to ask again for them to go back and look at it one more time. Thank you. I want to just say briefly. Um, there, we did carefully consider everything we heard in the meetings, and we respectfully listened to them all, and we did deliberate. But again, as we explained, we felt that the safety of benefits there for cyclists and all users, this is a good design for that location, and that's what we believe when we looked at it. I will also say that when it comes to the traffic that is happening uh, at Sand Street entered those well, several times, you're correct. When the right turn was banned from Tillery Street going to Adams Street to go to Bridge, and a lot of that's have to do with traffic backups on Adams, or possible that right turn was to remain, we knew that Sand Street was going to get more traffic from that, and obviously that it has uh, increased in traffic quite a bit since that change. So one of the things we were certainly looking at was we were trying to divert people to both Manhattan Bridge uh, other areas on the BQ they could get on and try to avoid going there. We're still getting a sense of where those vehicles are coming from. We're seeing there's some signage or other uh, things we can do to guide vehicles away from that entrance to go the other ways to get the Manhattan, Brooklyn bridges or BQ another way. And signage is one of the things we're thinking about looking to improve that. But yes, we knew that Sand Street was going to have more of a, a buildup of traffic after the change was made. Okay, we, the, the, we're 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 we. I I I, don't, I thank the DOT for their presentation. I thank them for coming back for the board. I, I'm uh, I'm sorry uh, that uh, whatever it would be what we we approve cannot be implemented. The next thing on the agenda is the chair, chairperson's report. And, and I, I wanna go over a couple of things. Over the summer, I've had extensive discussions with the MTA on York Street. You know, they're supposed to be doing a ADA review and a review of the uh, York Street uh, station. Uh, that is still ongoing. Uh, there is, as part of one of the rezonings in, uh, in that area, there's going to be $10 million allocated towards the reconstruction of hopefully an ADA accessible second exit entrance, or at least an ADA accessible first entrance. Uh, so that's something that's been ongoing over the summer. Uh, it's been, you know, a been fairly busy summer. I did, did the BQE. Uh, we've had various um, sundry things on the BQE, and uh, uh, that's all, all I have to report on. Uh, is there any other business that the community board wants to bring up? Sid? Uh, yes. I'm going to bring up something from 2004, the rezoning of downtown Brooklyn. A community benefit was ADA compliance for every subway station. There are no studies that discuss all of the development, the 40 high rises that we have gotten in the downtown community board to district and transportation. What are all these impacts that come from all this additional buildings and folk and activity that result from these high rises? Everybody's getting Ubers and deliveries and Amazon and all that stuff. There is no analysis of the impact on public transportation, but certainly we don't have a plan to make every ADA station, every subway station ADA compliant, which was agreed to in 2004. So the York Street is one station. We've already gotten uh, a half million dollars 
for the Nevin Street station. There's no discussion of making that station ADA compliant, even though there's lots of construction planned on the block that would be ideal for ADA compliance. So we have to look at the entire downtown district and set an ADA compliance for every subway station. MTA has to be called out for this. Okay, well, we'll, we'll see if we can get them down for the next meeting. I, have, I see three people, so hands are up. Uh, uh, let's start with uh, uh, Brian. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, I had other business I wanted to Go ahead. bring up. Um, so I'm, I'm sitting here on the ground uh, because I attended a uh, rally you know, in Union Square today based on the uh, traffic fatalities we've had this year, the highest uh, since Mayor de Blasio has been in office. Um, I also attended uh, for President and Democratic mayoral nominee Eric Adams uh, press event yesterday at uh, Vanderbilt and Gates uh, where the um, three-month-old child uh, um, who was- Apolline uh, Mong Gulamin was her name. Thank you. Thank you, Sid. Um, she was killed um, and I wanted to uh, I, I wanted to ask the committee um, to support writing a letter uh, in favor of the Crash Victim uh, Rights and Safety Act, which is a, a collection of eight bills um, uh, that did not uh, get signed or did not get passed by both houses of the legislature um, in the previous session of the of state legislature, but uh, will be reintroduced in the coming one. Um, I don't necessarily need a motion tonight, but I will um, pass along the summary of the bills uh, to uh, the board office because I would like to make a motion uh, that we support this legislation. Um, right lawyers who are elected officials saying so um, because I, I don't know what we're doing here. We, you know, every, this whole meeting, we started off talking about there are too many cars on the uh, restaurants. Mr. Howells, Mr. Howells, we're, we're losing your audio. Can you kill your video feed? I, I want, I have a question. Uh, Brian, does that include, you know, the, the, uh, uh, stuff that was the city wanted to pass about dealing with you know the really terrible scoff laws like the person who was driving this car who had 160 traffic violations since 2017 91 speeds in a school zone does that include things making that more difficult because it's really outrageous yeah, that, um, that, the one I'm sorry. Yes, one of the bills would be uh, to allow the state to suspend the registration of vehicles six uh, speed camera violations in it. Um, there are other. Uh, there's also allowing the speed cameras to operate 24/7 instead of 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. on weekdays only, as they are currently uh, limited to operate. Um, there are a bunch of others, but yes, including the bill that you were discussing. So. You, you know, you know, this guy was had a, a Pennsylvania license plate. You know, one one of the problems with these kinds of things is that suspending his, you know, registration if he has a Pennsylvania license uh, license plate does absolutely no good. You boot the car, then the sheriff will take it away. Well, that's so the you know the dangerous vehicle abatement act. Um, will hopefully take effect uh, next next month. We'll start booting vehicles um, for the, you know, the insane number of speeding speed camera violations. Um, and you're right, Sid, that the person who did this, you know, his license was suspended. Um, he had 160 violations, caught speeding in school zones 91 times. I mean, at some point, there's really little we can do, you know, passing laws other than to make sure that people cannot 
you know, drive at high speeds on our streets. And I don't really have any solutions for that tonight, but these bills. Okay, Brian, bring, bring it up next time. I'm really going to have to go on to the next person. Ken Wynn. Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, this is uh, actually my first community board meeting that I'm attending. Um, I have seen some of you around the neighborhood. Um, I'd like to bring something to the attention of the, the transportation committee um, because I know you guys are in charge of open streets. Um, if I can share um, this video right here. So I live on Willoughby between Washington and Waverly. And this is what I hear every morning from 8 a.m. until 8 p.m. All day. And this is all day. All right. Because what do you hear? I don't hear anything. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear anything. Are you guys not able to? Can, can you hear audio as well? If I share a video? I'm sorry. I'm like cutting into. The audio is not playing. Oh, Only the video. Oh. Oh, sorry again. Try hear this. Let's see if you can hear it. I hear nothing. Um, that's. Am I There's able to share? Someone playing music. Why can't I get my fucking? So I'm I'm sorry. So basically. All day. I hear it. It's... Ah, now can you hear it? I hear it. I hear it. It's bad. Okay. It's bad. That's pretty bad, isn't it? It's loud music as well. Is it, it's, no, it's, it's, describe it's what not, it's, it's basically the sound of these barriers being dragged across the street. Um, the barriers were added for the purposes of COVID protocol because they wanted to widen the streets and allow more people to, I guess, not be close to each other. However, um, it never ends, basically. And I see that there's a concerted effort to make this a permanent fixture in the neighborhood, to make Willoughby Avenue from Washington Avenue until, until Fort Green Park an open street where everyone can just walk in the street and not use the sidewalk is, I guess that's old fashioned. Um, can you describe what's causing the noise? I'm not clear what, what do you think causing is causing the noise? The noise? They're dragging, Constantly. They're dragging the metal barriers over the street. Right, because it's a residential neighborhood and business goes through this neighborhood and people come and go throughout the day. I, I work from home, so I'm basically hearing that all day and night because the, the I, I'm not sure who I'm seeing open streets is no longer managed by the local community. It's being managed by DOT, right? And it's only supposed to be from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., I believe. It's from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Okay, 8 a.m. Okay. It's all day. And then also, I guess people forget to move it at 8 p.m. So... There are people who I guess, you know, they've, they've tried to turn Willoughby Avenue into some type of resort or Disney World or something. They think it's supposed to be there 24 seven. So these people drag it back across at night. So all night I'm hearing that drag all across, you know, uh, my street. Also, um, if we take a look right here, right? This is what the street looks like when the barriers are there. Right. right. If an ambulance needs to get down this street, yeah, they like they did a couple of months ago, they have to get out, right, move, move this, it. right, drive in, and then move it back. One of my neighbors, actually, and I'll show, right, she actually had a health issue, and she, she couldn't attend tonight. She had a health issue, and it took them a solid three minutes additionally just to get here. Right to to to. Oh, sorry. Let me. I'm trying to sh share this photo. Chairman, uh, I, I I think we got the point. I mean, I right. we, we we empathize with you. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly what to do. I I think you're going to have to talk. I mean, I don't know. Maybe at night you want to go up there, chain them up, and lock them up, and then lock unlock them in the morning so they won't move into you. See, that's the thing. That's not my responsibility. And furthermore, Mr. Myers. 
This particular every, open street is not managed by volunteers. It is managed by paid DOT employees. Right. right. But, but here's the thing. How did that go down without actual input from the homeowners and the community who actually live here? This whole thing was backdoored, right? Because they knew if they asked us, oh, you want to close your street off the track? And been like, no, you use Irwin, the sidewalk. Irwin. You're, you know, this is too I've given you much more than two minutes. I would suggest you talk with uh, uh, the people at the board office and see if they can help you with this. Um, you're saying there were six months of publicly noticed community meetings. I, I emailed the community board and they said uh, they put up flyers in the supermarket and stuff. When was I supposed to see those flyers? When were the homeowners supposed to during a pandemic? I'm going to move on to someone else. Thank you. One second, said, excuse me one second um mm -hmm. i don't know if there's anyone else from dot still on but um committee member brian howard put a suggestion in the chat um that there's a community that actually put tennis balls on the on the bottom of the barrier so they don't make that grating sound and maybe that's something we can ask dot to do what what is the noise but again Please talk with Kerwin, talk with uh, Caroline offline. Thank you. Richard Morrow. Good evening. I'm here tonight representing the 8th Fourth Precinct, actually the, uh, the whole Brooklyn North Police Department. Um, I wanted to let everyone know here, I mean, I'm, I'm dealing with the safety department, the safety issue of, of this transportation thing. But the, the police department is recruiting people now. This is the time for us, you and me, to recommend people we think will be adequate, resourceful, responsible people to represent us as the New York City the police department. So please, if you know anybody, anywhere that you think would be representative and, 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 and responsible to be a, a representative of the police department, this is the time for them to uh, apply. I want to thank you and have a good evening. That's all. Thank you. Andrew Rose, Gregory. Hi. Uh... Hi. This is my first time at a community board meeting that I uh, was able to get into. Uh, very exciting to be here. Thanks everyone for all your time. Um, like uh, Brian before me, I've really um, had on my mind this year all the pedestrian deaths um, in our district. And um, one of the things that I, uh, I'm hoping that the community board would consider um, kind of re-going through with the DOT is the 2016 um, pedestrian safety and bike lane proposal for Clinton Avenue. Um, I found it to be a really great proposal and I understand that the meeting that it was proposed at was pretty, um, there's a lot of negative feedback, but as I recall, the meeting was held pretty early in the evening at 4.30 or 5 p.m. And um, I'm hopeful that now that uh, the meetings are being held over Zoom and at a later hour that some uh, voices that would support such a proposal would be able to be heard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? I got a motion to adjourn. Oh no, do we have to, we have to approve, we have to approve the minutes from, uh, we have to approve the minutes from uh, June 17th. Has everybody read the minutes from June 17th? Anybody have any comments or uh, corrections? Motion to approve. Any, we need uh, to, right? We just need corrections, uh, yeah. right? Any, any corrections? Well, I'm going to correct. I do. Uh, then no further business. Anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Seconded. Thank you. Interesting meeting. Have a good evening, everyone. Have a good night.